Hi, I'm Charles with Anycap. This is my recap for the anime Berserk of Gluttony. If you like my recaps, please consider subscribing. The story begins as a masked man fights several monsters. He demonstrates exceptional strength but is unsatisfied and wants more. We then watch as a man on a carriage is attacked by the same goblins and cries for help. Luckily for him, a couple of warriors arrive and the man is glad to be saved. The warriors easily defeat several of them but there are hundreds more. This isn't a problem though as they have more members in their group and proclaim that they will defeat all the monsters. Afterwards, we meet our protagonist named Fate, whose stomach growls from hunger. The band of warriors make their triumphant return and Fate hears them talking about their success. Fate states that he could never go goblin hunting like them since he is completely useless and he has a stomach that never stops growling. Fate explains that he blames all his misfortune on his useless skill called gluttony. He reminds himself to be grateful though as at least he has a job. Some time later everyone marvels as the holy knights make their way through the town. They are a trio of Valeric siblings. A man then fears for his life as he accidentally drops some food that touches one of them and the one named Hato questions what the peasant is doing. The peasant begins to answer but Hato becomes furious that the man is speaking to him. The peasant begins to apologize but this makes them even more mad. They warn that anyone that insults the holy knights will have their heads cut off. They decide to leave but tell the man that he is lucky to still be alive. Everyone is upset to watch this happen but no one is brave enough to do anything about it. At the castle, Fate is glad that the day is almost over and exclaims that it's almost time to go home. The knights make their way to the castle where they ask Fate if he thinks he has done a good job filling in for them. Fate thinks he has so Raphael gives him his pay. As if throwing it on the ground wasn't bad enough, they make him pick it up in front of them too. Hato very clearly steps on Fate's hand on purpose, but mockingly apologizes as he states that Fate was so filthy that he didn't notice him. Fate's stomach begins to growl at the most awkward moment and Raphael points out how disgusting Fate is. The knights are furious since the growling makes it seem like they don't pay him enough and they beat him relentlessly. Fate thinks about how in this world, there are haves and there are have-nots. What separates them are the special powers bestowed by the gods, their skills. The knights keep treating him like a punching bag and explain that he owes his livelihood to them. Someone with a worthless skill like his is only earning money thanks to the grace of holy knights like them. They tell him that he should be grateful and when he slacks off, it reflects poorly on them. They demand that he get on his feet but only to knock him back down. They believe he needs to be taught a lesson and explain that defiant dogs need strict discipline. Just then, they are told to stop since inflicting that kind of abuse on citizens they have sworn to protect is not an act of a holy knight. The girl talking is named Roxy and she explains that watching the gate is an honorable duty for a holy knight. A duty that should be their responsibility. The knights consider it a difference of opinion but decide that it's best to leave. Roxy helps the beaten down loser but he notices Raphael giving him the dirtiest look. Roxy cleans him up and tells him that helping him is no problem since they are the same when it comes to watching gates. Furthermore, this is how a holy knight like herself should conduct themselves. She takes over guarding the gate and tells fate to tell her if anything like this happens again. Instead of accepting the gesture like a normal person, fate just tells her that he is used to it and leaves. Afterward, we see why he said that as he thinks about how Raphael is and there's no telling what he might do. It turns out that Fate isn't a complete loser as he is just trying to protect Roxy and doesn't want to risk getting her involved. The bartender explains to Fate that if he keeps letting the knights treat him that way, he's going to end up like the last guy. There's only one outcome for that and it's a nasty one. On his way home, Fate curses how his stomach is still growling even though he just ate an entire meal. He condemns his gluttony skill and wishes he could have been born with something worthwhile. He is not asking to be a holy knight and he would take being a warrior or even a merchant or a craftsman. However, there's no changing how things are. He states that when you have nothing, you're just trapped as a loser. Just then, Fate notices some thieves attacking someone and the wimp's first thought is to get Roxy. He tells her what's going on and she leaves the useless loser to take over her spot as a guard. He seems to just be okay with this and just stands by while he hears her beat up the thieves. Just then, one of the thieves begins to run towards Fate and his cowardly instincts immediately tell him to run away. However, Fate stops himself and thinks about how Roxy trusted him with guarding the gate and if he runs, it'll cause trouble for her. Fate then fights against every cowardly bone in his body to prepare to battle. He notices that the thief is already injured and only now becomes confident that he can stop him. 
Fate lets out a scream, giving his best impression of a brave warrior, and makes a hole right in the thief's chest. Just then, a voice states that his gluttony skill has been activated, and his stats will now increase. Fate can't understand what's happening, and the voice states that the skills Identify and Telepathy have been added. Fate has never been more confused in his life, just as Roxy returns from the fight. Of course, she is concerned for his life since he is so weak, but Fate notices something strange. He heard words coming from her, but her lips didn't move, and it was almost like he could hear her inner voice. He explains that he is okay, and it happens again. She states that she has to report everything, but Fate is shocked to see that he can't hear it anymore. He tells her that she can take credit for his kill, since he is sure it would cause problems for him if Raphael found out. Roxy wanted to give him credit, but as a show of gratitude, she settles on offering him a job working for her family. He initially tries to decline, but she doesn't listen, and asks him if he intends to serve the Valerix until it kills him. Fate begins to consider it and thinks about the two paths. On one side is a future where he is treated like trash all the time, and on the other side, he can work for Roxy. Fate is concerned that if he leaves, then the person that replaces him will just get treated like trash instead. However, Roxy tells him to stop thinking so much and just ignore that very good point he made. Fate listens to her advice and agrees to work for her family. That night, Fate sits on his sorry excuse for a bed in his bedroom that looks like a prison and shockingly realizes that all his stats are now in the triple digits. His new skills are also a mystery, but he realizes that he must have been using telepathy. He has no clue what is happening to his body, but grows confident as he might not be able to beat monsters with his new stats. The next day, Fate searches for a sword, but the merchant is disappointed to see that he is poor. The merchant shoots him away as Fate thinks about how it's been 5 years since he came to the royal capital and two silver coins are everything he has been able to save up by working. All hope is unlost, however, as the merchant tells him that he can still afford the trash weapons he keeps in a barrel. The merchant turns his back, giving Fate the perfect opportunity to take whatever he wants, but Fate decides to just look in the barrel instead. While doing so, he uses his new identify skill to read the stats of all the barrel weapons. They all have zero for both durability and strength, but one sword captures his eye. It's filthy and has been treated like trash, so Fate can't help but notice how he has those qualities as well. Just then, Fate is shocked as he hears the words, hey you, come from the sword. The sword named Greed states that it will make it worth his while and tells Fate to just hurry up and buy him. Greed knows about Fate's gluttony and it says it's because they have a lot in common. Fate leaves his only two coins and happily takes his new talking sword. Elsewhere, the Valerics talk about how Roxy is apparently trying to hire Fate for the Hart household without even asking them. The girl named Memo wants to teach her what happens when someone defies the Valeric family, but Raphael points out that nobodies like Fate can easily be replaced. Besides that, the Harts and the Valerics are part of the five great families that support the kingdom, and there's no point in complicating that now. Raphael heads to the military district, prompting Memo to ask what he plans to study this time. He shocks her though as he plans to study how to become immortal. Sometime later, Fate walks with his talking sword and it warns him that something is approaching. A goblin appears from nowhere, but Fate is now able to destroy it. Doing so activates his gluttony skill again, and his stats are increased even more. This time, the skill's strength boost has been added. Greed then has a good laugh as Fate is in great trouble when hundreds of goblins appear. However, Fate seems like a completely new person as he slices through several of the goblins. After every single elimination, his gluttony skill is activated, and he just keeps going. The words gluttony skill activated are repeated hundreds of times as Fate finishes off all the goblins, and he is shocked to see that his stats have increased to a crazy amount. Greed points out that Fate must be fool now, and Fate notices that his stomach hasn't growled even once that day, which has never happened before. Fate is completely confused though since he was under the impression that people were born with the only skills they would ever have. Greed points out that this is true, but Fate's gluttony skill makes him different. Normally, stats increase from battles, and based on one's experience, their level goes up. However, the gluttony skill steals stats and other skills, at the cost of not benefiting from experience. Fate begins to understand and realizes that that must be why he is still level 1. Greed then surprises Fate as he explains that he knows this because they are the same. Just then, they notice the band of warriors approaching, and Greed tells Fate that his gluttony skill isn't the kind of thing he wants other people finding out about. It's one of the skills that defy divine law. 
Fate determines that he must do his fighting alone, but Greed reminds him that he has him now, and Fate will never be alone again. Fate is glad that Greed has accepted him as his master, but Greed tells him to calm down with all the master talk. Just before they leave, Greed reminds him to take the goblin ears so Fate can get paid. Afterward, Fate collects his reward and thinks about all the food he wants to get, but Greed reminds him that his maintenance comes first. Greed wants to be treated like the gem he is, but Fate thinks he is seeing himself too highly. The sword explains though that they don't call him Greed for nothing. Just then they run into a man and a little girl that's with him asks for help. Fate uses Identify to see this man's threat level in case he just wants to ignore the whole thing, but finds that he has a skill that allows him to hide his stats from the Identify skill. This means there's no telling what this guy is capable of. Greed wonders what he will do and Fate shows that he is a completely different person now as he states that they can't just ignore the girl's cry for help. They follow him and the scummy guy tells the girl that she will serve as a slave to the Holy Knights. Greed points out that the guy is pretty tough and tells Fate that this is his last chance to turn back. As he prepares to fight, Fate thinks about how he finally has some power now and if someone's suffering in front of him, he wants to help them with it. Elsewhere, a woman of the church speaks to a bunch of sad parentless children. Instead of trying to find them some parents, the nun tells them about the Holy Laplace, the creator of their world. When Laplace departed the world, she gifted the people special powers known as skills. The children, probably wishing she would have gifted them some parents, can only eat if they give their thanks so they do. One kid is super edgy though. He doesn't stuff his face like the others and explains that the Holy Laplace doesn't play fair. The Holy Knights and Warriors have amazing skills, but he has such a weak one, and his weak skill is probably why both his parents haven't come back from getting the milk. The Woman of the Cloth explains that in the old times, when Holy Laplace protected the world, there were no skills or stats, nor did monsters exist. Back then, everyone was equal. This sounds like heaven to the unwanted child, and he wishes that he had been born back then. Just then, another nun arrives and frantically explains that she can't find one of their missing orphans. She leaves to continue her search, and the other nun sighs as she wonders where the girl named Sahara has gone. Back near Fate, we see that Sahara is actually the girl he followed. The kidnapper lets out his frustrations on a steel beam and leaves, probably because that hurt a lot and he doesn't want to admit it. However, this gives our boy the opportunity he has been waiting for to rescue the girl. Unfortunately, the bad guy was standing right there and compares Fate to all the other foolish heroes that challenge him out of some misguided notion of justice. The despicable villain points out that Fate has no chance of beating him, especially while protecting the girl. Fate wants to get her to safety, but he doesn't even know where that would be. Luckily, Greed has an idea and tells Fate to back away. The bandana-loving bad guy thinks Fate is weaker than him, so Greed thinks that they can take advantage of his overconfidence. The bad guy chases them and points out that if he kills Fate in front of the girl, then she will never disobey him again. Greed is somehow able to sense the man and tells Fate to knock over some boxes, and Fate faces the man head on. Greed becomes concerned when the man uses his sharp edge skill and instructs Fate to just strike him down through his sword. Fate does just that as he uses Greed to just slice right through everything it touches, and Fate demands an explanation from Bandana Man. The man refuses to tell Fate which Holy Knight had him kidnap the girl, so Fate resorts to good old fashioned torture. The man can't take the excruciating pain any longer and reveals that it was Hato. A quick scene then shows how evil Hato is as he uses orphans to help him with his target practice. Fate managed to save the girl though and finds that her stomach is grumbling. They formally introduce themselves and go to get some food. Apparently the girl has never eaten before as she tries to bite food that is clearly scolding hot and Fate reminds her to be careful. Sahara cries as it actually turns out that she has never eaten meat before, so Fate gives her his too. Later, Fate takes her back to the orphanage and is surprised when he is thanked for the first time in his entire life. Fate explains that he has a weak skill just like she does, and all it does is make him hungry. Even though Fate seemingly hated his own life just the day before, he thinks he has turned into some sort of life coach and gives Sahara some advice. He states that no matter how hard things get, if you can laugh them off, one day you'll find happiness. These words actually turn out to be that of his father. Back then, he didn't understand, but his father telling him that helped him make it to this point. The self-help guru states that this is why he wants Sahara to survive too, and he leaves. A quick look at his stats shows that Fate is progressing rapidly, and Greed congratulates him on learning his first technical skill, the one-handed sword technique, Sharp Edge. This is a big deal since with technical skills, he gets tech arts, which are like secret techniques. 
This specific one allows Fate to attack twice in the space of one strike. That's the sharp edge Bandana Man was going to use, so Fate would have been in big trouble if he did. Greed calls Fate a hero, but our humble protagonist states that he isn't one, and if he had known about the sharp edge attack, he wouldn't have risked it. Greed points out that the truth is, battles come down to luck of the moment. There is no guarantee the stronger person will always win, so Fate realizes that luck must have been on his side. Fate thinks to himself that he wants to get stronger, strong enough that he can win without getting lucky. Just then, Greed reminds him that his first day of working for the Hearts will be the next day, and Fate screams in agony as he remembers that he didn't buy any clothes. At a bar, a man explains that someone named Sir Mason was struck down by a divine dragon. It is uncertain what will happen to the Hart family, but it's likely that Roxy will succeed him. Unfortunately, Mr. Mason was the one keeping the Holy Knights from going completely out of control, and the old man is not sure that even Lady Roxy can keep them in line. The drunk asks about Fate, and the bartender explains that he used to drop by after work every day. The next day, Fate is amazed, as it's his first time in the Knights District. The Hart family estate is just as amazing, and Roxy arrives to greet him. Fate is taken aback by her appearance, and she compliments him on how well he cleans up. With that awkward interaction out of the way, Roxy brings him into another one by introducing Fate to her recently deceased father. She explains that he was taken out five days ago by a divine dragon in Galia. Fate thinks about how Galia is a continent that's dominated by monsters. One of the Holy Knight's major duties is keeping them contained. Roxy explains that the duty fell to the Hart family this year. A dangerous task, but not one that should have been deadly. However, a divine dragon that hadn't left its lair in over a thousand years killed her father's entire force. Fate is in disbelief as he realizes that Roxy looked out for him these past few days even though she was dealing with the loss of her father. She doesn't want him to be sad though. She is the head of the house now and wants them to work together to make it a joyful place. They go to shake hands, but Fate knows that it will activate his telepathy, so he points at some random person. Haru is the chief maid and she asks Fate to make sure he conducts himself in a manner befitting a servant of the Hart family. Fate agrees but seems to completely forget that as he shovels food into his mouth like he's preparing for a hibernation he didn't tell anyone about. A week later, Fate works so hard that the other servants tell him to get some rest. They reveal that he thought he was a bit strange since they always see him talking to his sword and he was shaking when he ate meat. Fate's stomach growls very loudly in front of them and they can't believe it since they all just ate. Fate is called to meet with Roxy, but his stomach continues to growl and not even Fate understands what's going on. Roxy tries to have a conversation with him, but Fate can only think about how he's strangely just getting hungrier and hungrier. He fears he won't be able to hold back any longer, but Roxy snaps him out of it. The two relate over their dead fathers since Fate's father died in a monster hunt as well. Roxy calls Fate family, but he wants to be something more. Before he can tell her though, she denies his request, and even more surprisingly, Fate begins to faint. Later, Fate wakes up in his room with a note from Roxy telling him to take the day off. Fate asks Greed what's going on with him since his hunger has never been this bad, and he can't hold himself together anymore. Greed reveals that once the gluttony skill gets a taste of souls, there's no stopping it. The more Fate devours, the stronger he will get, and the more he devours, the more he will want. Fate is destined to seek out souls to consume until the day he dies. Fate wonders what will happen if he doesn't, and is horrified to hear that he will starve to death or lose control and start attacking anyone in his path. Fate can't believe that as it makes him sound like some kind of monster. Greed gives him a tip though. He tells Fate that when his hunger approaches its limit, it will show in his eyes. Greed reiterates Fate's life has completely changed and there's no turning back now. Fate heads outside and walks past a group of people. Our hungry hero is shocked to realize that they smell delicious for some reason, and Greed explains that it's because his hunger boost has kicked in. It's what his red eyes indicate and is a temporary power that enables effective use of the gluttony skill. During this time, Fate will have better night vision, be able to track prey by scent, and weaker prey will be terrified and paralyzed. This makes sense as they go outside the kingdom and find several goblins terrified. Our once innocent and frail hero is a completely different person now, as he helps himself to a massacre. With that group finished, they head to the Hobgoblin Forest. Fate continues the massacre, but seems to become upset, as he wonders how much more he needs before he is free from his hunger. Hours pass, and Greed points out that it's over. Fate hopes to never feel like that again, so Greed tells him that he will have to hunt monsters every now and then, and feed souls to gluttony. Just then, Fate is shocked to see that a Goblin King has appeared. 
It doesn't have much of an edge on him stat-wise, but it does have a health regeneration skill. It heals wounds and with it, Fate would be able to keep fighting even if he got injured. Our boy definitely wants some of that good Deadpool power and goes after the Goblin King. Fate gets disgusted though as the Goblin devours a human, and Greed Coley points out that humans are a fine meal for monsters. Fate manages to get the drop on the giant troll but freezes for a moment when he sees the human body. The fight continues but Greed becomes frustrated that Fate is only dodging. Fate is concerned about getting attacked but Greed tells him to trust him and so he does. They manage to land the final blow and Fate is glad to see that his stats have gone up even more. The skill health regeneration has also been added but Fate is exhausted now. Greed then reveals that with Fate's current stats, he will be able to access Greed's first level so he can achieve another form. All Fate has to do is hand over his stats as an offering to him. With his new form, Greed will be able to provide Fate with new functions. This sounds pretty awesome so Fate would like to give it a try, but is shocked when Greed reveals that he will have to give him all the stats he has gained since they met. Fate is of course hesitant but Greed points out that his name is Greed after all. Fate is still hesitant so Greed reveals that if he doesn't unlock it, he will lose the right to wield him. Greed points out that Fate can get stronger on his own or he can make him strong too, so they can work together. Fate determines that he doesn't have much of a choice and Greed is the only partner for him. Greed tells him that he won't regret it and begins the process. It's a grand sight and Fate can feel the power leaving him. With the process complete, Greed reveals that his new form is a magic bow. Some dumb goblin shows up at the absolute worst possible moment for him and Greed instructs Fate to draw on the bow as the magical arrows will appear on their own. It's an amazing bow as Fate can aim wherever and his arrow will always land. Afterwards, Fate takes some goblin ears and leaves them on the doorsteps of the church, which I'm sure they will love to find first thing in the morning. Later, our heroic protagonist stops an intruder but is shocked to find that it's actually Roxy dressed like a peasant. Fate wonders if she's really planning to go to the castle just like a normal old nobody, so she decides to tell him a secret since he has already seen her. She is going into town on a secret inspection. Roxy asks him not to tell anyone and imagines what Haru would say if she found out. Fate promises to not say a word so she thanks him, but she also has the brilliant idea to have him accompany her as her escort. Fate is already a peasant so he doesn't need a disguise and they head into town. Fate keeps calling her milady, so Greed must remind him to stop since people will notice. Roxy reminds him as well, prompting Greed to make a snide remark. Fate tells Greed to shut up, but Roxy thinks he was talking to her, so Fate just changes the subject. Roxy tells him to call her Lexi, and Greed can't help but make another remark, this time about how she couldn't think of a more creative name. Fate tells Greed to shut up again, causing the clueless Roxy to apologize to Fate for being so annoying. Fate urgently explains that it was just a misunderstanding, and Roxy, trying to act like she didn't just reject our boy very recently, says that she was excited to be going into town with him. The sarcastic sword makes yet another remark, causing Fate to threaten him, but Roxy stops him as she doesn't want anyone being so rough with their weapon. She realizes that she has never had a good look at his sword, and Fate hesitates to show her. This is really bad since someone with a worthless skill like his wouldn't normally have a sword, and she might think it's weird. Not to mention how monstrous his gluttony skill is. He remembers Greed's words explaining how once it gets a taste of souls there's no stopping it, and how if he doesn't feed it he will lose control and start attacking anyone in his path. Fate determines that he can't let her learn about his gluttony skill, but Butterfingers drops his sword and Roxy takes a closer look. She doesn't seem to learn anything from it, but tells Fate that it does need some maintenance. Roxy then flexes super hard as she offers to take him to the Hart family's personal blacksmith later. Fate tells Greed to be happy since he will be getting all fixed up, but Greed is completely silent. Fate wonders what is wrong but is shocked when his own sword tells him to shut up as he is basking in the moment. Greed says he is still in heaven after smelling Roxy's scent, so Fate decides that he might just have to throw Greed around after all. They finally make it to the very busy town. Roxy finds some grapes and the merchant explains that they were picked from the Hart family's vineyard. Even though it's her vineyard that she can just eat from directly, she decides to try one. Fate is amazed by the taste, prompting the cocky Roxy to brag about how those grapes are grown at home. The merchant hears this, and just seconds into their mission, it seems like she has already blown their cover. However, Greed gives Fate an idea, and our hero saves the day by explaining that Lexi has a relative that works there. Roxy is impressed by his quick thinking, but Greed tells Fate that he owes him one. Just then, the crowd gets all flustered as some holy knights are approaching. The crowd is surprised to see a holy knight in the market and think about how these types of things have started to happen only after Sir Mason died. At the worst possible moment, Fate's stomach begins to growl, 
causing the Holy Knight to become furious. Fate doesn't want to cause a commotion, so he decides to just apologize. His apology isn't enough for the Holy Knight though. This Holy Knight has some serious issues as he wants to embarrass Fate for some reason. He tries to step on Fate, but Roxy stops him. The Holy Knight turns his attention to the peasant girl, but begins to recognize her. The crowd thinks the same as they wonder if she is Lady Roxy. Greed comes up with the brilliant idea to have Fate pretend they are a couple. He explains that if Fate gets really clingy, no one will think it's Lady Roxy. Our boy is shocked to hear such a bold idea, but Roxy hears him repeat it, and thinks it's genius. She grabs our hero and they pretend to bicker about him not eating the breakfast she made him. The incredibly awkward interaction seems to get the job done, as everyone is cringing too hard to say anything, allowing the two to get away. Just then, Fate realizes that he can hear Roxy's thoughts and she thinks about how she has never locked arms with a boy before. She thinks about how fast her heart is racing, causing our boy to panic. Roxy decides that they need to keep moving, and Fate begins to think that escorting Lady Roxy might be a bit too tough for him. Moments later, Roxy feeds into a stereotype as she explains that she is a girl, so of course she would be interested in an absurdly gigantic gem. There are also some ores there which may or may not have gems in them. Fate uses Identify to cheat and see if there is a gem in one, but Greed tells him to be careful since merchants hate people that can use Identify. Apparently, Roxy couldn't care less about those stupid ores as she's just looking at more gems. Fate is amazed since at this moment, Roxy just seems like a normal girl, not a holy knight. The merchant offers them a discount so Fate can buy something for his girl, but he just gets embarrassed and Roxy decides that she has no use for gems anyway. Roxy moves on quickly to ask if Fate knows any active warriors, since she has some questions for them. Luckily for them, they overhear some guys talking about all the dead goblins that were recently found. Rumor is that it's a wandering monster that did it. The problem with that though is that it doesn't explain how the orphanage in the slums had Goblin King ears donated to it. Unfortunately for Roxy, they don't have any more information, so she asks Fate to take her where warriors gathered. Fate realizes that this is actually what her inspection is about, and she reveals that she's investigating the wandering monster said to have appeared around the capital lately. Fate is at a loss for words since he is actually this wandering monster, and Greed makes another smart aleck remark about how interesting of a twist this is. Fate heads to the bar he used to go to where the bartender doesn't even recognize him at first. The bartender is surprised to see that Fate is still alive, but even more stunned to see that he has a girlfriend now. Fate worries that Roxy might be getting offended by people calling her his girlfriend, and Greed points out that she might even have Fate executed for it. I guess Roxy was flustered too as she absolutely destroys a cup, but the bartender says it's okay since it happens all the time. Greed tells Fate that she was probably feeling self-conscious around him, and this causes Fate to obliterate his cup too. Greed says that it's good since it's a sign that he's getting stronger, and the bartender says that that cup was on its last legs anyway. The carefree bartender then spills the beans as he has heard about a warrior who made a killing off of goblin corpses. This warrior went out hunting and found a mountain of goblin corpses with their ears still intact. Roxy points out that if a warrior did all that work, they wouldn't just leave a bunch of valuable corpses around, and determines that it must have been a monster that has migrated from another region. That'll be bad for business though since a lot of business travel is done through those goblin planes. If there's some mysterious creature on the prowl, people won't want to travel there. Fate gets depressed knowing that he is to blame, but gets distracted when his old friend arrives to be startled by Fate's ghost. The old man reveals a popular theory that the roaming monster is a lich. This is very troublesome which is why the Holy Knights will be taking direct action to deal with it. Greed is worried to hear that the Holy Knights are getting involved since he just drained all of Fate's stats and Fate would get destroyed by them. The old man wants to know why the girl is so curious, but she isn't clever enough to think of a good answer. Fate can't help either since he is too busy thinking about how horrible things would be if Roxy joins the hunt and sees him doing his gluttony thing. Just then, some traveling warriors arrive demanding drinks and demanding that Roxy join them for some fun. Our boy springs into action, but Roxy shows she can handle her business easily. The warriors determine that only a holy knight could have that much power, and Roxy finally doesn't deny it. The bartender knew all along, but the stupid warriors are amazed to realize that it's Roxy of the Hart family, one of the five families supporting the king. They apologize profusely, even going as far as to give her all their money. Roxy of course rejects it and expresses shame to see that the people the Holy Knights have sworn to protect view them as objects of fear. Her father dreamed of a world where Holy Knights and lowly peasants could laugh together. This is a dream she shares with him. They all begin to get along and Fate thinks that until her dreams come true, he will follow her. Sometime later, Greed enjoys being fixed up a little too much, but we see that it worked out really well as he feels like a whole new sword. 
Afterwards, Roxy explains that she didn't know about the hunt because it's being led by the Valeric family and they simply didn't inform her. Just then, the two hear that Hato is hurting someone. The Valerics explain that they are simply taking a lost child into their protection. Fate releases the boy as it doesn't look like protection to them and Roxy tells the Valerics that they will take care of the boy. However, she asks Raphael why she wasn't informed about the hunt for the wandering monster. He explains that he assumed she would be too busy mourning her departed father, but she points out that she is just fine. The Valerics decide to just leave, but Hato the jerk tells Fate that he should stick to acting like the trash he is. Fate doesn't back down though, so Raphael must tell Hato to drop it. The two take the boy to find his mother, and Fate remembers when he once got lost as a kid. It was after his father died and he moved to the capital. He looks back and wonders what happened to the holy knight who looked after him back then. Just when it seems like they won't be able to find the boy's mother, she appears out of nowhere. Fate is glad but is amazed to see just how happy Roxy is to have helped the boy. The simp stares for a bit too long though and suggests that they head back home. Roxy reminds him that if they get in trouble, they will do it together, and he agrees. When they return, Fate hopes that days like this one could last forever, but he knows that just is impossible. He asks Greed for a way to hunt monsters without Roxy finding out, and Greed can only think of one thing. He suggests a perception warping magic item. He then leads Fate to a shop to buy a mask that will make them look different to whoever sees them. Later, Fate gives Roxy one of the ores she was clearly not interested in. He thanks her for giving him a job that has allowed him to find friends that he now considers family. Fate apologizes for not being able to get her the gem she was looking at, but Roxy explains that she's actually really happy with what he got her. This powerful beast of a woman just casually cracks the thing open with her bare hands, and Fate points out how useful his identify skill is as there's some pretty shiny stuff inside. Roxy promises to cherish it forever and wonders what she will give Fate back in return. Her ideas are a year's supply of meat or a whetstone for sharpening his sword but Fate says none of that is necessary. However, Greed tells him to shut up and accept that whetstone since he needs to be taken care of. It seems like another happy ending, however we see that the menacing looking Raphael has gathered other knights to discuss their excursion to Galia. Sometime later, a group of adventurers are shocked to find that the Lich got the drop on them again as all the monsters in a certain area have been eliminated. Their shock quickly turns to pants wetting fear as these poor fools realize that the Lich that they now call Corpse is right in front of them. They run to change their underwear, and Fate thinks about how much he likes his new nickname, Corpse. Greed wonders if he is done for the day, but he isn't. Fate explains that he wants to get his stats as high as he can before the Holy Knights come after him. The next day, Fate looks like he's about to pass out from the stress of his double life shenanigans. Roxy interrupts him while he's hard at work to tell him that she has a secret mission for him. On the way there, Roxy shows him her family's land, and this guy thinks that his big secret mission will be harvesting grapes. She explains that she just wanted to show him their vineyard since he liked the grapes that one time. When they arrive at their destination, Roxy is concerned for her mother's health, but she explains that she's feeling better than usual. Roxy introduces her boy, not as her new friend or the guy that just bought her her most cherished gift, but as a servant she hired, and she brought him to introduce to everyone. They greet each other and we learn that Roxy's mother's name is Aisha. Fate is glad to see that she's actually really nice, but shocked when she calls him over to ask if he likes her daughter. The two can't believe she would ask that, but Aisha makes it clear that she meant if he liked her as a boss. Our boy Fate then goes above and beyond as he declares that he cares a great deal for Roxy. And if he were allowed to, he would like to serve her until the end of his life. This is some pretty heavy stuff he is saying for someone Roxy just called her servant, so Roxy runs off to her room. Aisha tells Fate not to worry though, since Roxy has always run off whenever things got uncomfortable, just like this very, very awkward situation. She explains that Roxy was always a crybaby and would even throw a fit from just a glimpse of a bug. Faye points out how different that is from her cold, powerful behavior in the capital and Aisha says that she still can't believe her little girl became a holy knight. Aisha worries about her but Fate assures her that Roxy is a great holy knight. He tells her that the people have a lot of faith in her and she can't help but be proud. We then see Roxy in her room with a creepy doll and she has a memory of her father. He was proud of her becoming a holy knight and she told him that she wanted to be the kind of holy knight he is. However, she realizes that she hasn't fulfilled her promise yet and shamefully puts down the 3D printed action figure of him. A while later, we find that the big secret was actually to harvest grapes and Fate takes a moment to taste some delicious juice. A man explains that the lords have personally helped cultivate this land for generations and everyone on the property is proud to have pitched in to create this flavor. Fate seems not to care about asking sensitive questions and asks if that includes the now dead Sir Mason. 
The man points out how his death must be hard on Roxy, but he is glad that she came to harvest grapes like she does every year. The man explains that she also does hunting while there, since it's harvest time for most crops, and that's when monsters called kobolds show up looking for food. He explains that the monsters come from a certain valley, but the two stop to have a laugh when our boy's stomach growls. Fate laughs on the outside, but knows that something dangerous is happening. Greed explains that after all those goblins, he is not surprised, since Fate's gluttony skill hungers for different souls. Afterwards, Roxy sends Fate home ahead of her as she has something to do. On his way home though, Fate sees a girl with a very dangerous looking weapon. This girl stops him and Fate is shocked to see that she has the same eyes he does. He tries to check her stats, but it doesn't work. The girl gives him a good look and strangely just says that it looks like she is too early. Fate tries to figure out what the heck this random chick is talking about, but she simply tells him that she originally came for the kobolds, but now he can have them. She declares that he owes her one and tells him that they will meet again. Greed says that he has no clue who that was, but Fate doesn't believe him. Fate points out how Greed always says something without him even asking, but for some strange reason, Greed is being awfully quiet now. Greed says he isn't lying and explains that there is some stuff even he and all his greatness doesn't know. Roxy shows up and is surprised as the white haired girl is a galleon. Fate points out though that Gallia was destroyed. We then get a little history lesson as Professor Roxy explains that 4000 years ago, Gallia was a great military power. But a surge in monsters caused their nation to collapse and most of their people died. This girl is clearly a survivor though and Roxy is amazed as she has never seen such a full blooded galleon before. The two begin heading home and Fate wonders if Roxy will be okay hunting the monsters on her own. Roxy explains to the overly concerned simp that she won't be alone as the warriors who work there will be with her. On top of that, she is a holy knight so she is certain that things will be fine. Butterfingers drops the grapes though and the two have a good laugh. The next day, the farmers find out that the monsters had a grand old time in the vineyard. Moments later, we watch as everyone hides and prepares to get revenge on the kobolds. However, they are all shocked to see an unknown monster appear. Fate is way more hungry than shocked though, and Greed can tell that Fate's mouth must be watering. Mouth watering at just the sight of the monster is a big problem though, as it means that time is running out. Fate realizes that he is nearly in a starvation state and panics as he can't let Roxy see him like that. He checks the monster's stats to find it's an unbelievable level 50, and it's called the Bringer of Lamentation. It's also a crowned beast, which is a powerful monster born from accumulated aggression over a long period of time. Greed says that it's nothing like the usual monsters and it's really bad news. They return to the village where everyone is panicking as they are certain that they don't have a chance against the monster. However, Roxy shows off her speech giving skills as she calms everyone down by assuring them that she will slay the powerful beast. She tells the warriors to prepare for battle, but Greed tells Fate that they don't stand a chance. Roxy is told that the warriors need time to get ready, so they decide to wait until tomorrow to fight. Greed wants to know what the plan is, and Fate thinks about how a monster at level 50 is too much for him at the moment. However, he can't ignore the people that need his help, and can't ignore what's happening on Hart's land. More importantly though, he can't let Roxy die, and he tells Greed to get ready for battle. Later that night, Fate goes to the forest, and Greed mocks him for always playing the hero. They watch the monsters walk around, and Greed explains that there are several kobold warriors around the crowned beast. Greed asks Fate what the plan is, and he simply says that he's going to fight like a glutton. He transforms Greed into his bow form, and begins slaying the monsters. The stupid monsters have no clue what's happening, and we see that Fate's gluttony skill is activated after every elimination. Fate fires an arrow at the crowned beast, and this crazy thing uses one of his soldiers as a shield. Fate switches back to his sword and uses it to close the gap by slaying several monsters. His gluttony skill has been activated numerous times and he sees that his stats have gone way up. It isn't enough to satisfy him though so he switches back to his bow and fires an arrow. He confidently states that this will end the fight but he's wrong and the crowned beast grabs his arrow. Greed determines that Fate will just have to fight it up close but they are shocked when the crowned beast prepares a move called Ruinous Strike. Greed explains that it can penetrate armor to shatter bone and pulverize organs. They pull back as they have to dodge a different attack, but still end up getting hit by the shockwave. The attack sends Fate into a river where Greed desperately calls for him to wake up. A kobold soldier moves in for a final attack, but its arms get sliced off, and we find that Fate was just pretending to be out cold. Fate fights another kobold, but easily defeats it, once again activating his gluttony skill. Greed explains that Fate should be able to use his first level hidden art now. It will cost Fate 10% of his current stats, but it will allow him to put a quick end to the fight. Fate agrees to it and Greed's bow transformation gets a huge upgrade. 
Fate fires the powerful shot, and the Crown Beast tries to counter it, but it's no hope and he is defeated. Fate thinks that the shot might have been a bit overkill, and his gluttony skill is activated once again. However, Fate is in agonizing pain. He can't understand why, and Greed explains that he overloaded from devouring a soul of higher quality for the first time. Greed desperately tells him to hold it in, since if he doesn't, it'll be even worse than his starvation state. Fate does his best to fight it, but the pain is unbearable. The next day, warriors arrive to find the aftermath of the massacre, and wonder if it was done by magic arrows. Roxy is there as well, and she wonders who could have done the massive damage. The next day, we see that Fate is fine, as Roxy tells her mother about what they saw. Roxy remembers that she saw that Galia girl the other day, and thinks that she might have been the one that eliminated the monsters. Fate sighs in relief, as he is glad that he isn't a suspect. Roxy's ready to return to the capital, and her mother thinks about how happy Roxy looks when she's talking to Fate. Later, Aisha asks Fate to stay by her daughter's side to support her, but we already know that Fate is a simp and he was going to do that anyway. She explains that she doesn't need him to become a holy knight or anything, because what's most valuable about him is his desire to help Roxy. She then kind of insults Fate as she compares herself to him. She says that she never had any skill to speak of, but was still able to support her husband. She doesn't have much time left, which is why she wants Fate to support Roxy in her place and she tells him to take his time to think about it, so he does. On the way home, he thinks about if he's worthy of something like that, since he's hiding such a big secret from the world. That night, Fate is shocked to see that his eye is still red, and he feels an uncontrollable hunger, even though he just slaughtered a bunch of goblins. Greed explains that goblins won't satisfy his monstrous hunger anymore, but Fate points out that there are no stronger monsters around. Time is running out for him to find something that will satiate his growing hunger, so Greed tells him that he needs to decide what comes next. Sometime later, Fate sits at the bar, hiding his red eye, and he decides that he's not worthy to stand at Roxy's side. The gossiping old man walks in, talking about how Hado is going to join the hunt, and Fate is shocked to hear this. It's clear that Hado is hated, as the old man wishes that they would send him to Galia instead to become monster food. The bartender says people like Hado usually stick to where it's safest, and some other poor soul is going to end up on the Galia expedition. This shocks Fate as well, as he can't believe they're already planning another expedition so soon after Mr. Mason's death. The others are upset about it too, and the old man just hopes that the worst case scenario doesn't come true. Unfortunately, it does come true, as we see that the Holy Knights have gathered, and they select Hado's replacement for the Galia expedition. Afterwards, at the capital, Roxy shockingly tells her father that she has been assigned to the expedition to Galia. However, Fate arrives and pleads for her not to go. If she goes now, she might never come back. It's too late though, Roxy has decided to go and there's nothing he can do about it. Fate can only watch her leave and thinks about what else the old man said. He said that the Hart family is a nuisance for the Valerics and other holy knights. Rumor has it that they were the ones that arranged for the expedition to Galia. We then see that the Valerics are celebrating as they will soon be rid of the nuisance. The two other siblings leave the rest to Hado, as the two of them are off to a place called Tenburn. Hado wants Raphael to tell him about his big secret involving immortality. However, Raphael just tells him that he is counting on Hado to deal with the Lich. That night, Faith thinks about how he can't overturn official orders and he can't stop Roxy. However, he won't let the Holy Knights treat people like trash and cause more suffering. We then shockingly see that Fate has decided how he wants to satisfy his hunger as he was waiting for Hado. Hado is glad to finally meet Corpse, and Fate turns to him with his glowing red eye. Hado has his very eager men attack first, but Fate is so much more powerful than they are now that they don't even look like they're moving to him. Fate then absolutely destroys these bums, as Hado can only watch in shock. Fate turns to the leftovers with murderous intent, and the rest of Hado's group run for their lives. Hado is clearly terrified, but still talks a big game, as he says that he won't let Corpse make a fool of him. He calls Corpse a monster, and vows not to let him get away with what he has done. Fate then shockingly removes his mask to reveal his real identity, and Hado stunned as he wonders how trash like him could be this powerful. Fate has no reason to explain a single thing, and Hado does his best to keep from wetting himself. Hado composes himself a bit to remind Fate that he is the second son of the Valeric family, the great holy knight Hado Valeric. Unfortunately for him, Fate isn't the guy he used to bully, and Fate tells Hado to show him his Holy Knight powers that he is so proud of. Fate checks his stats and explains that Hado has the Holy Sword technique, the special skill needed in order to become a Holy Knight. Fate wonders how someone like Hado ended up with it, and asks Greed if he will be able to shatter a Holy Sword. Greed is confident he's way better than Hado's garbage sword, and tells our boy to swing to his heart's content. 
The foolish Hato starts getting confident again out of nowhere as he calls Fate dumb for getting in the range of his sword. He uses an immense attack but is absolutely stunned when Fate ends up behind him. Hato desperately tries to attack Fate but our boy just slices his sword in half like it's butter. Hato can't believe his holy sword was destroyed so easily and Fate gives him back the other piece. Our boy is an absolute powerhouse now compared to the weakling he was before and is now the one telling Hato to pick something up off the ground. Hato is at a complete loss for words as I'm sure he has soiled himself and Fate reminds him that he is a holy knight so he shouldn't want to run away so badly. Hato trips over riddled with fear so Fate calls him pathetic and forces him up. Fate plans to teach Hato a lesson and reminds him of when Hato once told him that defiant dogs need strict discipline. The horrified Hato knows what's coming and begs Fate to stop. Fate just ignores him and introduces his face to the side of a mountain. Fate thrashes this dude through the forest leaving Hato almost unrecognizable and Hato begs for him to stop. Fate can't believe that this guy could beg for mercy since he treats people like insects. If that wasn't bad enough, Fate's precious Roxy is now heading into danger because of filth like him. Hato makes another desperate attempt to beg for him to stop but our boy is beyond angry at this point and sends this dude flying high in the air. Fate exchanges his stats again so Greed can transform into the big bow and releases the devastating attack. It's never been more obvious how insanely powerful Fate is as his attack has left this great holy knight without any limbs. Hato wonders why Fate would possibly leave him alive and now begs for him to just end his life. Fate has questions first and Hato already knows he wants to know about Roxy. He reveals that Roxy actually volunteered to go on the expedition to Galia. She said that if her life could save even a single citizen of the kingdom then it would be worth it. I guess Hato thought it over and decided that life without limbs wouldn't be so bad because he now begs Fate to spare his life. He promises to get Roxy's Galia expedition cancelled and tells Fate not to do something stupid. Fate prepares to end his life and Hato picks the absolute worst thing to say as he tells Fate that getting revenge for Roxy's sake would be a big mistake. Fate tells him to shut up and declares that he is doing this for himself. He plunges his blade straight through Hato's chest and says that it is his revenge. With Hato now dead, Fate's gluttony skill activates and he receives the skill Holy Sword Technique. Greed points out that this technically makes Fate a holy knight now but Fate knows that the capital would never accept that and angrily states that he would want to be one anyway. Greed explains that Fate can access his second level so Fate accepts because the idea of Hato's stats being inside him makes him want to puke. Greed transforms yet again and reveals that he can now become a great scythe. It doesn't just look cool, the curse embedded in the blade can cut through anything. This is great and all but our simp wishes that it could cut short Roxy's trip to Galia. Elsewhere Roxy prepares for the expedition and puts the gem Fate gave her around her neck. Fate can't do anything about her leaving and can only watch with the background characters. Roxy tries to tell everyone not to be so sad and explains that 3 years will be over in no time. Roxy makes her way to Fate where he tries to tell her how he feels. However he stops when he reminds himself that he is a monster and he is no good for her. Roxy knows they will see each other again and the two say their goodbyes. Afterwards Haru gives Fate the recommendation letter that Roxy left him. As long as Fate is employed at a lord's manor then the Valerics won't be able to hurt him. Fate realizes that Roxy worried about him till the very end but he decides that he will reject the letter. Of course Haru is shocked so Fate explains that he's going to make his way as a warrior from now on. That night though we find out the truth. Fate tells Greed that if he can't stop Lady Roxy from going to Galia then he will at the very least support her. Fate begins his journey to Galia and we see that a girl is watching him as she says that things are shaping up nicely. Sometime later Roxy gives a speech to all the troops joining the expedition. She states that they will all need to do their best to destroy the divine dragon that has awoken after a millennium of silence. After that Roxy is glad to see that a girl named Miria and a guy named Mugen will be joining as well. Miria points out how this guy is just another reckless oddball looking for a chance to test their strength against the dragon. This muscled up dude can't deny that and Roxy calms him down. Mugen explains that he actually volunteered because of Roxy's father and he just wants to avenge him. Roxy wonders if his family is against him going to Galia but he explains that his daughter named Rain couldn't care less and just wanted him to bring back some Galian relics. The two begin bickering again and Roxy has a good laugh as they are all becoming friends. Elsewhere we find that Mugen's daughter Rain is a researcher and she's in a lab filled with goblin body parts. She is told that certain ones come from the attacks by the lich called Corpse and it is pointed out that the arrow wounds aren't normal at all. She discovers that they are the magic arrows of the Black Sword, one of the weapons of mortal sin. The weapons of mortal sin are made of a material that can manipulate magic power at a high level. 
Not much else is known about these weapons, but Rain is certain that if they can control magic power, then they would expand the possibility spectrum for skills. The wielder would be extremely dangerous, but she would very much like to see one of these weapons. Fate arrives at Tetra, the hub for shipping headed towards the royal capital, a city of merchants where the best goods in the south are gathered. Greed is surprised to hear that Fate has been there before. Fate just says that he simply passed through, but her memory shows him getting hit by stones. Fate is then told that the carriage won't be leaving for Gallia till the next day, and as he leaves, Greed makes another one of his smart aleck comments about Roxy. Fate tells him to shut up and has to apologize to the carriage guy when he thinks he was talking to him. Fate decides to go eat some meat and we see that some guy is asking a group of warriors for their help. The money he is offering for their help isn't enough, so these jerks bully the poor guy. Fate arrives to easily wipe the floor with these guys and Shackling greets his old friend Set. A look into the past shows that Fate used to live there and his constant stomach growling would always get him beat up. We also see that Fate was very close to his father, who was a warrior. However, Fate's father would eventually die. The other villagers pointed out that Fate's father named Dean had the spear technique skill, so the village chief kept him around. However, Fate's skill was useless, so no one was willing to take care of him. These cold-hearted bastards decided that it would be best to just run him out of the village while calling him worthless garbage. Little did they know that treating a kid like garbage just moments after his father died would be the perfect villain origin story. Luckily for Set, Fate isn't a villain, as Fate is now the person he must ask to help his village. Fate is clearly not moved by this guy's tears, and explains that Set is the son of the village chief who exiled him. Greed urges Fate to help, but only because his gluttony skill needs to be fed, and the monsters attacking the guy's village would be perfect. Fate agrees to help and thinks about how even though he still resents the people, he still has memories of his father there. They arrive at the village, but the village chief is disappointed to see that his son has brought back the useless weakling he exiled. Set tries to vouch for Fate's strength after seeing him easily defeat the warriors, but the chief doesn't want to hear it and decides that they will just have to find warriors the next day. The chief's lackeys point out that screams have been heard from a nearby forest. The monsters are getting close and they don't have much time left, so the chief decides that they will just use Fate as a sacrifice to buy them some time. Fate has clearly had enough of this fool's insults, but Set begs him to calm down. At Set's house, Fate learns that Set's wife was ended by the monsters. Set regrets growing up thinking that his father was always right and explains that he only started to get his act together when his daughter was born. Set then explains that the monsters first showed up about a month ago. The witnesses say that there's more than one and they can apparently fly. They're nothing like the monsters the village has had to deal with before, so that is why they decided to hire some warriors. Just then, Fate's stomach growls loudly and Set goes to get him some food. Fate asks Greed if he has any idea what they're dealing with and he assumes that they are most likely gargoyles. They are sort of clever, so they start by doing probing attacks to see how humans react. And when the time is right, the entire pack attacks in a swarm. Set's daughter introduces herself and gives Fate a piece of candy to settle his stomach. They decide to play for a bit and this kid shows that she might be the final boss as she easily beats her boy in arm wrestling. Fate then begins to eat the food Set brought him but is shocked when he suddenly feels tired and faints. Set is surprised as well and the little girl explains that she just gave him some candy that her grandpa gave her. This silly little kid has no clue what she just did and Set begins to realize that his father was really serious about sacrificing Fate. Greed uses all this information to deduce that the candy was poisoned and Set tries to wake Fate up. There is no time for that though as he hears screams nearby and discovers that the monsters have made it to the village. The monsters waste no time and instantly start terrorizing the village as Greed tries to wake Fate up. He instantly gives up though when he realizes that it's useless because Fate was all drugged up. The village is quickly being torn to pieces and we see Set's father running through the streets. He is calling out for fate but only so they can use him as a sacrifice and he ends up meeting his own fate as he is eaten by a monster. Luckily, Set manages to make an antidote and wakes fate up. Fate has no clue where he even is but Set fills him in and apologizes for his stupid father's actions. Fate heads outside where he sees the nightmarish scene with monsters causing chaos everywhere. They are attacked and Greed points out that they will have a really hard time if the monsters just keep taking shots at them from above. A quick check of their stats reveals that they are level 27 with Fireball as their skill. Greed is certain that they don't have a chance the way things are now so he tells Fate to transform him into the Scythe. Fate does just that and instantly uses it on a Fireball. He is surprised when he thinks that the Scythe didn't work but Greed explains that it did cut the magic but the fire that it causes is a whole separate issue. The monsters seem to realize this as Greed explains that they are going to cover the area in fire instead of just attacking Fate directly. Fate refuses to be taken lightly though and uses an incredible attack that slices through every single dragon with one slice. His gluttony skill is activated and he earns the fireball skill. 
Unfortunately, the fight isn't over yet as the leader of the monsters remains. This giant behemoth is level 47 and its skills are fireball and fire resistance. Greed as useful as ever points out that the giant monster is going to close in on him to hit him with its fireball and that will be his best chance to bring it down. Fate heard him loud and clear as the beast approaches so Fate slices the thing right down the middle. Another victory means that his gluttony skill activates again, raising his level and earning him the skill of fire resistance. The next morning Set sadly says that most of the villagers perished including his father so the village is finished. As if this guy wasn't depressed enough, Fate piles on and points out that the soil there is no longer healthy and they will never be able to grow anything there ever again. Set is amazed to see that Fate can use the skill Identify and wonders why Fate risks his life as a warrior when he could easily make a living using his Identify skill. Fate thinks about how his gluttony skill is one that defies divine law and answers Set by saying that he has no choice but to fight. Set then shockingly tells Fate to hit him right in the face because he is a masochist and he wants to pay for what he did. Of course Fate is shocked but Greed encourages Fate to let the guy have it since he really needs it to help him feel better. Set is actually pretty surprised when Fate doesn't even hesitate. He tells the guy to clench his teeth and clocks him right in the face. Set thanks him for making things right and the two say their goodbyes. Fate heads home to see his dad who went to go get the milk in heaven. He thinks about how as bad as this village was he's going to hate to see it go. He will always have his memories with his father though so he tells his pops that he's going to be fine from now on. Elsewhere, Roxy is informed that they are approaching a place called Lanchester and she is warned about the Lord of Lanchester. The useless Mugen doesn't explain any further though and simply tells her that she will find out when they get there. Sometime later we find that Fate is being paid 3 gold coins to guard some guy in his wagon. The guy is worried that Fate might not be a great fighter especially since he caught our boy almost falling asleep. But Fate explains that while he may not look it, he can fight pretty decently. This might soon be tested as a group stops the carriage to explain that the road is closed. These jerks tell the man to leave everything of value behind if he wants to live, but Fate reveals himself. Greed hilariously points out that Fate should have asked for more money, and Fate points out how his greedy sword sure lives up to his name. The cart driver seems to have lost his mind as he begs Fate to save him since he has a wife and kids and he needs to bring the milk back home. The bandits see this as a sign of weakness and prepare to plunder, but a random attack sends them flying sky high. Greed says that he only knows of one person who could pull off such a powerful attack and we see that it's the girl from the other day. She tells Fate that he owes her for the cobalt she let him have and she asks if they can give her a ride. This girl ends up tipping the entire carriage the second she steps on and she must tell her insanely heavy weapon called Sloth to return to normal. The girl surprisingly knows that Fate has the gluttony skill as she calls him Fate of Gluttony and she reveals that she knows because she has a skill of Deadly Sin too. She is surprised that Fate doesn't know about the skills of Deadly Sin and Greed begins to casually whistle when she says that Greed should have told him. She introduces herself as Mine of Wrath and her stomach begins to growl just like Fate's does. Mine scarfs down most of Fate's jerky so he has to beg her to stop just as they arrive at their location. In town, a guy rescues a girl from some terrifying beast and he introduces himself as Rudolph, the Lord of Lanchester. The driver points out that it seems like Rudolph is preparing to welcome the expedition to Gallia and Fate is shocked since that means Roxy is coming. Greed has a gut busting laugh as he points out how Fate was desperately chasing after her and he ended up passing her by. The driver pays up but Mine takes the money pointing out that she was the one that rescued him. The boys decide to find a place to stay first but Mine is exhausted and falls asleep right there. Fate ends up having to carry her and Greed explains that she isn't much of a morning person. Fate wonders how Greed knows so much about her but Greed pretends to be a non-talking sword again as he goes completely silent. People are pretty nice in this town apparently as some random dudes greet Fate but he notices a strange mark on the back of their necks. Fate is then told he can't enter a part of town unless he is a citizen and he notices that the guards have a different mark than the others. Some other people have different marks as well so Greed assumes that it's most likely different social classes. The people don't even seem to mind so Greed determines that the citizens must really love Rudolph. Elsewhere we find that Rudolph is pretty ruthless as he punishes a couple people for not behaving the way he wants. The whole point of them acting so polite is to demonstrate the superiority of the Lanchester family to the Hart family. This guy is out of his mind as he slices one of these people up and he punishes the other for running off during a monster hunt. The guards realize that he has done two executions on the same day so his behavior is getting worse. Our group finds a place to stay and Greed finally reveals that Mine is an old acquaintance that he just keeps running into and the same goes for her weapon Sloth. Sloth is a weapon just like Greed, a weapon of mortal sin. Greed thinks Fate is ready so he explains what the skills of Deadly Sin are. 
pride, envy, lust, sloth, greed, wrath, and gluttony. These skills were born by defying the laws put forth by the divine. That is why they are called the skills of deadly sin and weapons of mortal sin. Among them, gluttony is particularly sinful for having the potential to disrupt the limits of the divine system of leveling. Fate thinks about how once gluttony tastes souls, there is no stopping it, and that's his punishment. Greed points out that they all have to pay in one way or another, and the same goes for mine. Fate still can't understand why he was the one that ended up with this skill. He always got mocked, made a fool of, for a useless skill that just makes him hungry all the time. And just when he thought he gained some power, it turned out that he needs to keep killing to survive. Fate gets upset as he wonders what good is such a power, but greed urges him to calm down. Emotional disturbance is never a good thing, but it could be extremely costly for fate. This is because if fate's mind isn't strong, gluttony will take it over in an instant. For this reason, fate needs to get strong enough to resist. Greed reveals that the trick is to sustain a state of near starvation, so fate instantly wants to go practice. To do this, they head outside, where greed tells him not to satisfy gluttony all at once, and the goal is to get his fill slowly. Their prey this time is a Sandman, so Greed has Fate cast the Fireball spell before he fires his arrow. This arrow does insane amounts of damage as the giant monster is instantly evaporated. Fate's gluttony skill consumes the monster's soul, but like always, it begins to desperately crave more. More Sandmen appear, causing Fate's hunger to grow so much that it causes him physical pain, but Greed reminds him to hang in there. Fate can barely fight back the urge to devour more souls, and he realizes that he has a long night ahead of him. Back at the inn, Mine wakes up starving and finds a poster that states that whoever defeats the Sand Golem will be rewarded. A mysterious man explains that not even Sir Rudolph can slay the Sand Golem, but if it isn't defeated, only death awaits. Back outside, Fate eliminates another Sandman, but he has gotten the hang of controlling the hunger between souls. It's not easy though, as he compares it to only drinking one sip of water at a time in a desert. They are done training for the night, so it's time to finally satisfy Gluttony. The timing works out perfectly as fate smells the scent of a crowned beast nearby, and it will make a fine main dish for the night. We see that his main dish is the sand golem, and it's attacking some people. Fate arrives to claim the beast for himself, but the people clearly don't know who they are talking to, as they tell him that he won't be able to beat the thing on his own. Greed wonders if fate is playing hero again, but our boy says he isn't, and he's just getting his fill. This giant sand thing is an insane level 60, and it shows its powerful attack but Fate counters it with his fire arrow. The arrow lands, but Fate is pushed back, and this thing uses its sandstorm attack. The all-knowing Greed warns that once it pulls Fate in, it will crush him with rocks. So Fate decides that he will just have to cut through the monster and its spell. He transforms Greed into the scythe to do just that, and prepares to finish it off. However, the monster's core escapes into the sand, so Fate switches to the big bow. Greed explains that he will need 20% of Fate's stats this time to get to the core, so Fate agrees and throws some fire on top of all that as well. This new attack is so powerful that it not only destroys the core but it erupts from the surface, and Fate's gluttony skill steals the sandstorm attack. The people he rescued are amazed by the performance as they have never seen anyone with such power, but point out that Fate is a bit shady looking. They introduce themselves and Fate just goes with his given nickname to introduce himself as Corpse. The group is surprised to see that Fate hardly has any equipment, so he asks Greed if he should get some. Greed points out that Fate doesn't need it at all. He has the ability to steal enemy skills and increase his own stats. Normal people can't do that, so they are the ones that need equipment. The next morning, Mime prepares to hunt the Sand Golem and becomes furious when Fate reveals that he already took it down. Fate goes to collect the reward, but Mime thinks he is lame for wearing a mask. Fate explains that he defeated the beast as corpse, so he had to collect the reward as corpse too. Just then, Sir Rudolph arrives to greet the man who defeated the Sand Golem. He says that Corpse will be serving him from now on, and he has no right to refuse. Fate is a bit confused, but the guy says that he has no choice, since when a holy knight makes a decision, others must simply obey. Mine isn't having any of it though, and explains that Corpse was hers first. Rudolph disrespects this girl and tells her to go home to her mommy, but Mine teaches him a lesson by sending him out a brand new exit in the building. Fate instantly realizes that this will be a huge problem for them, and decides that they need to get out of town while they have a chance. Sometime later, Fate wonders if Mine is really the one with the gluttony skill as she stuffs her face with more food. She points out that Rage uses a lot of calories, and Fate wonders where all the food even goes. Mine gets pretty angry hearing this, causing her weapon to become so heavy that their carriage is destroyed. Fixing the thing is going to cost Fate a pretty penny, and he is surprised to see that Mine just does whatever she feels like as she's already moving on. 
They enter a seemingly peaceful little town, but Gree points out that they are pretty close to Galia now, so monsters pose a huge threat. It's clear that someone very powerful must be protecting this village, and they can see a castle in the distance. They find the village chief and notice that he has a holy sword. He must be a holy knight, so he is probably the powerful guy defending the village. Before the chief allows them to stay there, he wants to fight fate first. There is something different about this guy as he is immediately able to tell that fate is using his identify skill on him. This guy somehow knows that fate is level 1 but has stats over 2 million. Fate wants to know when the guy used identify on him, but this guy isn't interested in chit chatting and just wants to fight. Fate is not one to back down so the two go at it. The fight doesn't last long though and the chief ends up winning. Fate assumes that his loss means that they can't stay there, but the chief senses that there is a purpose for them being there. The chief will allow them to stay but only on the surprising condition that fate will train under him. The chief says that there is something special about fate but our boy thinks that something sketchy is going on. This guy points out that fate doesn't know how to counter the identify skill and he predicts that fate isn't making the best of his other skills either. He assumes that it's because Fate's body hasn't become accustomed to all his new power. While Fate's current approach might work well against monsters, it definitely won't work against other powerful humans. Greed is getting more and more skeptical, especially since the Chief isn't asking for anything in return, but Fate points out that it's not every day that someone gets the opportunity to learn directly from a Holy Knight. Fate agrees to the condition and the Chief introduces himself as Aaron. Mine arrives and Aaron can immediately tell that she is a very capable warrior. Training starts with hand-to-hand -hand combat since Aaron believes it's the best way to learn to control stats. Aaron knows that this is something Fate struggles with since it's very common among warriors who suddenly become much stronger. They begin and Aaron gives Fate several tips along the way, fixing his posture and telling him that the more he flexes, the weaker and slower his movement will be. More importantly though, Fate will be able to generate more power from a relaxed state. Relaxing will also allow him to pursue unconscious power. Things are going pretty well but Fate feels immense pain again as Gluttony is acting up. Aaron sees that Fate's eye has changed color but he is forced back and he notices that Fate is suddenly moving much better. They continue fighting and Greed points out that Fate is able to move pretty well despite being nearly starved now. Their training ends for the day but Fate can smell a monster and he wonders if it's in the castle. Just then Aaron screams but we see that it's only because Mine had a solo eating party. Aaron goes to get more food and Fate does something mischievous to Mine as Greed warns him not to do it. Later that night, Aaron walks back home and stops for a moment to sadly stare at the castle. At his house, Fate finds a painting of Aaron's family and Greed points out how his son kind of looks like Fate. Greed realizes something and thinks he knows why Aaron is the chief of a village out in the middle of nowhere. Mine wakes up and is furious when she finds that her face has been vandalized. Sometime later, Aaron has Fate attempt to parry his attack just using a stick. Fate thinks that the stick will just break, but Aaron points out that he has trained him personally, so he should be fine. Fate does well to keep from being sliced in half and thinks about how he must predict the angle of his opponent's sword to help slide his stick along the blade. Aaron is very pleased with Fate and tells him that he is now able to control his immense stats. Mine wants to give our boy a reward, but it's actually just revenge as she gives him a goatee. That night, Fate explains their plans to leave the next day and thanks Aaron. He wants Mine to thank him too, but this chick is too busy stuffing her face again. Aaron says it's not a problem, so they should just enjoy the food to their heart's content. Unfortunately, the bottomless food pit that is Mine explains that it all tastes the same to her. Her sense of taste is gone, and Greed explains that it's the price she pays for her wrath skill. She reveals that she has a goal to achieve, and Aaron seems to have one too as he once again stares at the castle. This is when he shockingly reveals that 15 years ago, that castle was his. One day he had to leave the castle but it came under attack and his son desperately tried to defend it for his father. Unfortunately his family and people all fell to a crowned beast that had grown incredibly powerful from accumulated aggression. Ever since then the castle has belonged to a genesis of death, a lich lord. Aaron says that his family is in its clutches but he stops when something is wrong with fate. Fate steps outside but Aaron comes with as he knows that fate is planning to go to the castle. Aaron decides to go as well as this is a great chance for him to put his past to rest. Mine has decided to watch the village probably so she can eat everything and the little entrepreneur requests 50 gold for her trouble. Moments later, Fate takes out one of the guards at the castle. Aaron is amazed by Fate's magic arrow since it's a technique so difficult to manage that they even stop studying it in the capital. Fate is pretty humble about it but Greed wants all the credit for it being so great. They make their way past several skeleton guards to get inside the castle 
and they take the sound of music as an invitation. On the second floor, Aaron is shocked to see that his son is the one playing the piano. Aaron is absolutely stunned and refuses to believe any of it when he sees his wife there as well. Their names are Luke and Diana, and they both have been waiting for him to bring back the milk. Aaron thought they were dead, but they have no clue what he is talking about and just ask if he accomplished his mission. Aaron did, so they want to hear all about it. Greed points out to Fate that they are definitely not alive. Aaron prepares to give his son a souvenir he got him, but Fate is shocked when his son stabs him. Aaron is no fool though and saw it coming. He points out how strong his son has gotten and Luke says that it's because he had to protect the castle in his father's absence. Luke is furious as he states that Aaron always abandoned them for work. He always chose his loyalty to the capital over them, so Luke can't believe that his father has only showed up after all this time just to end their lives. Fate plans to use his scythe to cut through the illusion, but Greed reveals that it will also mean slaying all of them. Souls that are devoured by gluttony can never pass on. It's like being confined to an endless hell with no hope of salvation. Luke attacks again, but Fate determines that he can't do that to them. Aaron says that he wants to handle them himself anyway, so Fate rushes off to find the Lich. Outside the room, Fate can smell the Lich in a crowd. He spots it and uses a magic arrow to force it out. This thing is insanely powerful as Fate sees that all of its stats are above a million. Fate uses what he learned in training to fight the Lich and manages to destroy its weapon. The Lich still has its ability to control corpses though and they all beg Fate to save them. Fate refuses to attack them, causing him to be in a real bad spot. Luckily though, Aaron arrives and cuts the tendons in their limbs to immobilize them. Aaron sees his wife's corpse in the crowd and thinks back to a time when his poor family begged him not to go on a dangerous mission. He blames himself for not returning sooner and decides that he must take responsibility for it now by ending their suffering. He uses his Grand Cross skill to shine a powerful light at them, but it's not enough. Greed tells Fate not to make it a habit when he grabs a holy sword and Fate helps Aaron with his Grand Cross attack. Their combined power lights up the entire room and wipes the evil lich off the face of the earth. Afterwards, Aaron apologizes to his family and their spirits appear. They tell him that it's not his fault, but Aaron knows that it was. He regrets ever leaving them in the first place and apologizes. He promises to live a life in a way that will honor their memory and finally gives his son the souvenir. Aaron says farewell to his ghost family and the illusion begins to reappear. The Lich makes one last attempt to take Aaron's life, but Fate destroys it and his gluttony skill steals all of this thing's crazy stats. Fate feels a lot of pain for a moment, but is glad that Aaron gets to say goodbye. They are gone now and Aaron says that once he finishes what he needs to do, he will join them. Afterwards, Aaron explains that he has exceeded his level limit and assumes that it was because of fighting by Fate's side. There is still an entire horde of monsters that need to be dealt with, so the two decide to have a competition. After that, Aaron gives Mine her fee for protecting the village and she says that money is needed to rebuild the village. This little capitalist explains that money doesn't lie and that is something a person learns if they live long enough. Aaron then remembers where he has seen her before. 50 years ago, monsters appeared in this town and he caught a glimpse of her. Fate is shocked to hear how long ago that was, and even more surprisingly, Aaron says that she looked exactly the same. Mine compliments his good eyes and tells Aaron that with the millennium of training, he might be able to catch up to her. She points out that humans have their limits, so Aaron wonders what that makes her. Her explanation is simple. She is a phantom who is not allowed to die. After Fate's eye returns to normal, he reveals to Aaron that he has a condition that requires him to slay monsters frequently. Surprisingly, Aaron knows that Fate's soul is affected by this. He tells Fate to return to the village after he does what he needs to do, as he has something very important to tell him. Elsewhere, Memel is amazed to see that Raphael has obtained the Philosopher's Stone. She doubted him at first, but is now beginning to think that he might be able to achieve immortality after all. When a servant enters the room, Raphael asks about Hato, mentioning how they haven't seen him since they got back. Raphael is stunned to hear from the servant that his brother was killed during the hunt. The servant adds that the one known as Corpse isn't a monster, but actually a skilled fighter. Overwhelmed by a surge of rage, Raphael becomes fixated on discovering who Corpse really is. Sometime later, Fate gets upset when he sees Mine stuffing her face with all their food, so she shares some with him. Mine uses him like a bed, but complains that he is in a great bed since he won't be quiet. Fate objects to the insults, but she's already out cold. Fate wants to know more about her past, but Greed just says that if they keep traveling together, he will get an idea about it. Fate is willing to wait, but Greed just warns him not to dig too deep. Nearby, Roxy tells her group that they are near the border to Galia. 
They reach the little village that Fate just left, and Roxy explains that a lich lord, Crown Beast, took over the castle near there. They check the castle, but don't sense any monsters there, and determine that it must have been freed. Eren arrives to greet them, and Mugen bows down to him. Mugen never thought he would ever be able to meet the great Eren Barbados, head of the Barbados family, an expert swordsman called the Blade of Light. Eren kind of just ignores the poor guy, and surprisingly already knows Roxy. He knew her parents and he was actually the one that gave her her name. Eren informs them of his retirement from being a hero. He failed to protect those he cared about, so he no longer has a reason to fight. Roxy is amazed that he was able to defeat the lich that took over the castle, but Eren reveals that he didn't do it alone. Miria wants to meet the powerful guy that helped him, and Roxy says that she needs the guy's name for the report that she sends back to the capital. Unfortunately for them, Fate told him not to tell anyone his name, so Eren apologizes as it's a secret. They prepare to leave, but Eren wants to know if it was a Valeric's idea for Roxy to go on the expedition to Galia. Roxy says that it was her choice, but Eren assumes that she was just manipulated. The Hart and Barbados families have always been annoyances to the Valerics. Roxy doesn't care as she will do anything to protect her people, and Eren is shocked to hear that her father passed away. Just then, Roxy is shocked as Eren offers to train her how to fight in Galia. He insists, so she gladly takes him up on the offer. They begin training and everyone else fixes up the village. Eren can see that Roxy has been taught well by her father, and she reiterates how she must become stronger so she can protect everyone. Fate and Mine have been walking for a while and have reached some kind of ruins inside of Galia. Mine surprisingly reveals that this is where she was born. She was taken to the Imperial capital right after she was born, so she doesn't remember the place at all. Fate can't believe it since Galia was destroyed 4,000 years ago. Walking further, they come upon some weird looking structure that looks like a cocoon. Greed explains that it's called a chimera. It was a biological weapon Galia's military tested out in the old days. It's some kind of vessel that has a bunch of monsters mashed together, but Greed says it should be called a failure since they were all supposed to be shut down. Mine reminds Fate that he owes her a favor, and he realizes that this means she wants him to fight the thing. His identify skill reveals that this thing has some terrifyingly high stats, and it's giving him an error for its skills. Greed explains that all the monsters mixed together means it's too unstable to read. This one is luckily still in the larvae state, so they should be able to beat it. But this shocks Fate since that means this giant thing isn't even fully grown yet. Mine explains that as long as its soul is intact, they can damage its body, but it won't die. This is why she needs Fate to use the soul-eating part of his gluttony power. His is the most sinful of all the skills of deadly sin. Mine is done talking though and wakes the thing up. This thing is huge and Fate can't understand why there is a human inside of it. It also has the same red eyes that he does and Mine explains that it's just intimidating him. Greed knows this as well so he tells Fate to stop looking right at her since he will be too frozen to move. The girl inside is the core of the chimera and Mine needs Fate to finish her off. Fate hesitates since any soul he eats will suffer an eternal torment forever, but Mine explains that this girl is nothing more than a monster wearing human skin. They will both die if he keeps being naive, and the Chimera proves this by using a huge attack. Fate wants to use the scythe, but Greed explains that it won't be able to cut off the attack since its magic works indirectly by doing damage with the lava. Mine tells him to step back and takes care of the lava wave. They then decide to split up. Mine manages to slice off its arm, and Fate is glad to see that his petrifying magic arrows work. It's far too early to celebrate though, since the giant chimera can regenerate. It's clear how fierce their opponent is, since it's a weapon capable of non-stop fighting with no support. Mine attacks again, and Fate realizes that she seems to be hitting harder than before. Greed explains that Sloth becomes heavier and more powerful with every swing. The big downside is that it really cuts down on her agility in the process. The monster is furious to have lost its arm again, and Fate feels a strange pressure. The thing undergoes a metamorphosis, so Mine tells Fate to stay back. Fate is reminded of Roxy, and he wonders if he is just being protected again. He knows that he won't be able to hold his head up high, just being protected all the time, and he wants to change. Fate wants to be the one that actually helps Roxy, and he wants to be someone with power. Fate knows what he has to do, and tells Mine that he will be putting himself in a half-starvation state. Mine knows the dangers in this. She tells him that if he is not careful and taps too deeply, then gluttony will overwhelm him. Fate is very aware and does it anyway. He begins the process but knows that if he messes up, then they will all pay the price. The process is extremely painful, but Fate does his best to control it. Mine holds back the beast, but Fate soon explains that he is ready and it's time to start fighting back. 
The monster sends out its exploding feathers, but Fate has an idea on how to use them. Greed has an idea of what he is planning, so he turns into a bow. Blowing up some feathers cause sand to go everywhere and cover the beast. Fate gives Greed 10% of his stats while using the Sandstorm skill on his arrow. His attack petrifies the giant for a moment, so mine awakens Sloth and unleashes a powerful attack. Fate is impressed, but Greed tells him to focus up since they need to finish off the monster before it regenerates. The Chimera protects itself with a barrier, and Fate is shocked when his scythe can't even break through it. Greed explains that Fate has to read the flow of magic power and aim for the weakest point, so he does just that. The barrier is broken, but Fate accidentally looks right into its eyes. The Chimera gets out of there as fast as it can, and Fate's eye begins to bleed. Fate is running out of time, so Mine tells him to get on her axe so she can send him into the sky. They need to hurry because the Chimera, named Haniel, is close to recovering. Mine sends him flying, and Greed reveals that Fate can now use his second level secret technique. It costs him 20% of his stats, but it gives the scythe another blade. Greed tells him to aim for where the center of the magic power is, so Fate focuses very hard to find it. However, just as he gets close, the Chimera traps him in her barrier. Greed can instantly tell that they are in grave danger, as the Chimera plans to cook herself and take him down with her. Fate must act quickly, so he uses an attack called Deadly Inferno. The attack hits her right at her core, but something strange happens. Fate sees a bunch of kids and wonders if his telepathy skill activated. Kids begin disappearing, but two girls are left. Surprisingly, one of them is the Chimera, and the other is mine. Fate's gluttony skill is activated as the fight is over, but he doesn't feel the usual exhilaration he gets after winning. Instead, he only feels a chest-tightening sadness. Greed says it's only normal, since even though the girl became a Chimera, he still ate one of his own kind. There is no pleasure to be had in doing that. Mine buries the girl and explains that she has forgotten what happened all those years ago. All that she knows now is that when someone becomes a Chimera, they have to be killed. If not, many more people will die. Fate thinks about how dangerous his gluttony skill is and fears that one day he might become something that has to be killed. Fate asks Mine for a favor and tells her that if he ever loses control of himself, then he wants her to end his life. She is the only one that can stop him if he goes berserk. Mine surprisingly hugs him and agrees to do it. Fate apologizes for having to ask, but thanks her for agreeing. Later, Fate decides to head towards Babylon, but Mine has work to do there since she promised some people that she would build a village for them. Surprisingly though, Mine says that she has a feeling that Fate will meet his demise before they meet again. Just then, Greed reaches level 3 and transforms into a magic shield. This resets all of his stats though, so Mine calls it ridiculous and begins leaving. Fate begs her to help him hunt until he gets his stats back up, but she just wants to know how much he is willing to pay. Sometime later, Fate reaches Babylon. It's the defensive wall between the kingdom and Galia. The walls are insanely strong and have lasted for millennia against the attacks of the Galia monsters. Greed explains that he has been there before with his previous wielder. This previous wielder also had a skill of deadly sin, but they passed away and left him behind. Greed points out that humans are mortal, but not being able to die sucks because he always has to say goodbye to people. Fate wonders if Greed is immortal, and Greed explains that weapons of mortal sin can't be destroyed. While walking through Babylon, a man announces that Babylon's new lord has come from the royal capital. Fate nervously puts on his mask, and Greed reminds him to calm down. Everyone celebrates Roxy's arrival, and Greed sheepishly tells Fate to wave like everyone else. Just then, Fate hears someone say that she's going to die, but wonders if he just imagined it. He didn't though as a mysterious girl states that Roxy's going to die there. Sometime later, Fate explains that a variety of warriors gather at Babylon. Former Holy Knights and even people with grudges against Holy Knights. Greed explains that if someone is strong enough, then their faults will be forgiven in Babylon. It's clear that they will need all the help they can get to deal with the monsters, so it's the perfect place for Fate. Alistair introduces himself to Roxy and shares his regret for not being able to save her father despite serving at his side. He apologizes, but Roxy tells him to raise his head since she is there to follow in her father's footsteps. Together, they will defend Galia from the monsters and defend the people. This dude looks deep into her eyes, but Miria doesn't like him at all. She prepares to intervene, but Mugen stops her and reminds her that messing with the Holy Knight could cost her her life. Roxy shows no interest in this guy and tells her companions that they will explore the city. Fate laments how much everything costs in the city, and Greed stops him as he just spotted a beautiful scabbard that is calling his name. Fate assumes that it will be too expensive, but Greed calls him a cheapskate and reminds Fate that he can always hunt monsters for money. The shop owner proves to be a strange guy as he somehow knows the exact kind of damage Fate's clothes have taken. 
Greed thinks that this means they can trust the guy and tells Fate to buy the scabbard. The shop owner explains that the scabbard he is asking about is just a display model, but he can make one for Fate that suits his sword perfectly. The man has never seen a sword like Greed, and Greed tells Fate that his glory is so obvious that he couldn't hide it if he tried. The shop owner explains that a scabbard for a unique sword like his will cost 500 gold coins, but that's way out of Fate's price range and he runs out of there. Things are expensive enough in Babylon, and they need to make sure they can cover their daily expenses before anything else. Just then, a group of warriors call out to Fate, calling him the guy in the skull mask. They assume that he wants to build his reputation on a monster hunt so he can work as a soldier in the capital, but Fate explains that he isn't looking to work for anyone. The guys apologize and Greed points out that if Fate dressed better, then he wouldn't have goons like them messing with him. Fate finally agrees and the two get excited about hunting a bunch of beasts so they can earn a bunch of money. They pass the border of Gallia and find that it stinks really bad. Monster carcasses are everywhere and mildly toxic spores fill the air. Greed warns him to not breathe since too many deep breaths will cause moss to grow in his lungs. Just then, Greed points out that a stampede is approaching. It's a bunch of orcs and they are armed with small weapons. There is about 50 of them and they are smart so they will probably use a coordinated attack. Greed recommends that Fate fight them like they are humans and Fate plans to use this opportunity to show off the fighting skills Aaron taught him. However, the warriors jump in first so Greed tells Fate to hurry up and steal the kills since the greedy sword wants his fancy scabbard. Fate doesn't want to be rude but luckily a ton more orcs appear to join the fight. Fate immediately jumps into action and Greed turns into a shield. It blocks physical and magical attacks so it's practically a moving fortress. Fate tries to think of a plan of attack but Greed tells him to rush in so he can show him what the shield is capable of. He has Fate run through everyone and Fate is amazed by how easy it is to just crush all the orcs in front of him. The attack is called the Shield Bash. It requires a lot of strength but Fate has plenty so he just runs all of the monsters over. There is an insane number of orcs so Fate's gluttony skill gets activated over and over again. The fight is over but Fate thinks it's strange that his gluttony skill isn't acting up like it used to and they wonder if this new control is what Eren was training him for. At a guild everyone gasps as they see how many orc gears Fate got all by himself and he cashes them in. The warriors from earlier accuse him of stealing them but Greed thinks about how these garbage warriors would have been the orcs dinner if it wasn't for Fate. One guy tries to take the ears, but our boy gives him one chance to back off. The dummy doesn't, so Fate crushes him. The other warriors try to gang up to take Fate's mask off, but it doesn't go too well for them. One guy almost manages to land an attack, but only gets his jewels kicked for the effort. Fate gets 100 gold coins for the ears, but Roxy shockingly arrives. She thinks he is causing trouble, but Fate, who is in disguise as Corpse, explains what happened. Roxy determines that Corpse might have gone a bit overboard, but it was indeed self-defense. She partially blames herself for Babylon falling into a bit of chaos, so she decides not to punish Corpse. She also takes it easy on the bumps he beat up and tells them that they will spend one night in jail so they can reflect on their pitiful lives. Miria tries to take off Fate's mask, but Mugen thinks masks are useful for hiding hideous faces. Fate formally introduces himself as Corpse, but Miria points out the very obvious when she says that isn't his real name. Before she leaves, Roxy thinks Corpse should take better care of his appearance, so our boy gets embarrassed and instantly rushes off to get new clothes. They think Corpse looks pretty weak, but know that can't be true since he destroyed all the bums in the guild. Fate's clothes are pretty torn up, so Greed thinks they should make an upgrade. Greed is greedy though and recommends they start by buying his expensive scabbard. The shop owner appears out of nowhere and introduces himself as Jade. Jade just opened his gear shop three months ago and he would really like it if Corpse took his gear into battle. Jade hasn't made a name for himself yet, so Corpse using his gear to fight would be great advertising. Jade has been waiting for the right warrior though and he has definitely hit the jackpot picking our protagonist. Fate agrees to the deal and the guy upgrades our boy's gear big time. Fate tells Greed to shut up when he makes a smart remark and has to apologize to Jade when Jade thinks he was talking to him. Jade is a frugal businessman as he still charges Fate for the gear, but Fate objects a bit and Jade gives it to him for half off. It costs him 40 gold, but Greed reminds him that he can always do more hunting. Fate's stomach growls and they find a food place that looks busy. Greed thinks it's probably because of their delicious food, but our boy is starving and will eat anything. It turns out that the crowd is actually filled with incels and the real reason they gathered was for some girl. Fate is stunned by this lady and finds that he can't look away. This girl walks right up to Fate. She somehow knows his real name and Fate is shocked since he is wearing his mask. 
She explains it is because they are two of a kind, so our hungry hero realizes that she must have a skill of deadly sin too. Her name is Eris, Eris of Lust. They sit down to have a tasty drink and Eris tells them to take off his mask since its perception alteration doesn't work on her. She also wants to get a better look at her boy, but her eyes do something to him. She apologizes as it's a side effect of her lust skill that gives off an uncontrollable charm effect. Anyone hit by it ends up falling in love with her. Eris surprisingly reveals that she has been watching Fate for a really long time, all the way back to the first episode. Eris explains that she is part of the second generation, so she doesn't know anyone from the first generation like mine that well. Eris doesn't get along with mine anyway, and she says it's because she is more developed than her. Eris congratulates him on slaying Hanyul and thanks him for saving her the trouble of having to do it. This girl definitely seems to know everything, but Eris explains that she doesn't know who moved the cocoon there. The Chimera all come from Galia's capital city, and she thinks there are still a few left. If they are allowed to mature, then it will mean huge trouble. Considering how weak the class of Holy Knights have become, they will not be able to exterminate them. Eris puts all that aside for now to get down to the real reason she wanted to meet with Fate. She explains that aside from wielding a skill of deadly sin, she is also a guardian of the kingdom. Nothing is more important to her than the kingdom. Even if something causes a great loss today, if it benefits the kingdom hundreds of years from now, she will approve. Fate can't understand what she is getting at, but is shocked when Eris reveals that Roxy is going to die in Galia. Fate is furious since it's clear that Eris wants Roxy dead, but she starts talking about aggression. She explains that when a monster is slain, its aggression lingers. That aggression never goes away, and over many years it builds up little by little. It eventually gives rise to a crowned beast, and the same phenomenon can occur among humans. Currently, there is a lot of oppression, discrimination, and destitution caused by the Holy Knights. All of the aggression aimed at them is building up within the people. Roxy is beloved by all the people, so the swell of aggression born from her death will combine with all the rest of the aggression that has been building up. All this aggression will fuel the birth of a human with an all-new type of power, and among them will be the future pillar of the kingdom with an incredible skill. Eris thinks it's the perfect plan, and she approves because Roxy's death will guide the kingdom in a better direction. Our boy gets really mad and points out that nothing good will ever come out of Roxy's death. None of the Holy Knights care about the people the way she does. Fate leaves before he loses his mind, but Eren thinks about how the plan is already in motion, and there is no stopping it. Our boy has never been more mad. He doesn't care who is planning this, and he doesn't care who he has to fight. Fate vows to protect Roxy at all costs. Sometime later, Roxy is told that they have lost contact with one of their squadrons in Galia. Roxy has everyone prepared to rescue them, as they will be going to Galia immediately. Fate is back at the shop where Jade tells him that they need some material called Duckstone to make a scabbard for his sword. It's a difficult material to get, and its supply is controlled by the kingdom, so he has no clue when he will have more. Greed wants them to just get some themselves, so Jade tells him that Duckstone can be found in Galia. Fate looks at a map of where they are headed, and it just so happens to be near Great Canyon, the same place Roxy is going. They are greeted by giant orcs upon arrival, so they use the shield to protect themselves. They use Shield Bash to destroy the hideous creatures, and Fate's Gluttony skill is activated a ton of times. Near Roxy, they are having a hard time getting to the Great Canyon, because compasses don't work there. They can't use the Sun or the Stars either, so Myriad condemns the clouds for getting in the way. Luckily, they can determine the direction by the concentration of orcs, since the orc colony is at the southernmost point. As long as they follow where all the orcs are, they will eventually get there. There are more dangerous monsters out there though, so they must proceed with caution. Elsewhere, Greed praises Fate for learning that he needs to rest before entering another fight. During his rest, Fate strangely sees the girl that was inside the Chimera. A terrifying noise doesn't allow him to hear what she is saying, and he quickly finds himself in a place filled with human tomato juice. There, he sees his victims, and he is pulled down by Hato. Fate wakes up, but has no clue what just happened. There is no time to think, however, as he detects monsters nearby. Greed points out that they are not orcs. They are crowned beasts and more than one of them. Fate uses his night vision skill to reveal that the monsters are salamanders. Fate takes one down using his bow, but he notices that there is something weird about these monsters. They usually run after taking major damage and they aren't coming after them. For some reason, they are still just going in the same direction and it's like they are being controlled by something. This is pretty strange behavior, so they decide to follow them. Back with Roxy, she is woken up when her group is attacked by several salamanders. 
They do major damage and Northern apologizes since the monster somehow broke through their defenses. Mugen just manages to save her from becoming barbecue and they are in awe of the power of these crowned beasts. Miria is furious so she attacks with her magical flaming sword but it doesn't work at all. Roxy rushes to her side but the two are quickly in danger. Luckily for them, Corpse arrives to save them. Mugen is very impressed with him as Corpse uses the common sharp edge skill with so much force. After Corpse finishes off the lizards, Roxy thanks him. She wants Miria to thank him too, but the little brat says that she didn't ask for help. They all introduce themselves and Miria finally decides to thank her savior. Northern thanks him as well, but Corpse is just curious about a strange mark on the salamanders. All the salamanders have the same marking and they point out how crown beasts don't usually team up like that. They were clearly targeting Roxy, but she says that it could have just been a coincidence. Things have gotten very strange lately, especially after the divine dragon came out of its nest. Sometime later, they all finally arrive at the Great Canyon. Corpse thanks them for helping him get there, and Roxy's quite happy that they had the same destination. Miria is a jealous little brat and takes Roxy away since they need to rescue the squadron. Roxy tries to say goodbye, but Fate hesitates to take her hand because he doesn't want his mind reading skill to activate. Miria takes his hand instead, and Fate can hear her thoughts. The little brat doesn't want him getting any ideas about getting close to Roxy, and wishes that he would just leave already. Roxy gets her to stop touching her man, and everyone says their goodbyes. Fate seems oddly okay with just letting her go, even though he knows that she is in great danger. Either way, Fate ends up in a seemingly purified area in Galia, and notices that monsters there are petrified. It's almost like a graveyard, and Fate is stunned when he sees himself petrified. He just imagined it though, so they continue their search for the duck stone. They don't find any yet, but they do spot Eris there. Fate immediately loses her, but turns to shockingly find a chimera. There is no core inside it though, so Greed assumes that it's just a prototype. It was buried in battle long ago, and the rocks that covered it crumbled. There are some empty spots near it, so it seems like some chimera were awakened. Three in total, so Fate wonders if Eris is responsible. An explosion shakes the ground, and it seems to have come from Roxy's direction. Fate rushes to her, and we see that her group is fighting against a terrifying chimera. Their power is overwhelming, but Corpse once again arrives to help them. His arrows don't really seem to be hurting them too much, and Roxy explains that Mugen and Northern were both injured protecting Miria. These chimera are able to heal, but Gree points out that it's much slower than Hanyo's healing was. Corpse explains to the others that their opponents are Chimera, and their cores are the weakness. Corpse recruits the help of the two girls, and they prepare to attack. The Chimera try to push them back with fire, but Fate just so happens to have fire resistance. One stupid Chimera tries to hide its core with its arms, but our heroes are too smart for that. Corpse chops one of them down, and Roxy destroys its core. Corpse admires the apple of his eye, and notices that she used Eren's swordsmanship. Miria counters a fire attack from one of the chimeras with her sword, but screams in terror as she thinks she's going to die. Greed is impressed with the young lady, and Corpse finally arrives to relieve her of her terror. She hates having to be saved by him again, but thanks him properly this time. Roxy has Miria take everyone to safety, and proclaims that Corpse and herself will take care of the remaining chimera. Our boy breaks out his scythe, and the pair use the same technique they used on the first chimera to attack the others. This is Fate's first time fighting alongside Roxy, but it feels way more natural than with mine or Eren. There is only one Chimera left now, but it can surprisingly fly. They plan to attack it when it lands, but the second it does, the ground collapses. Corpse takes a hold of Roxy and assures her that she will be safe in his hands. Roxy quickly trusts him and they hold each other as they fall. Sometime later, Fate wakes up and quickly begins to panic when he realizes that Roxy is on his lap, but he has lost his mask. Roxy wakes up, but our boy finds his mask at the very last second. Corpse impresses her with some sweet fireball magic, and he thinks about how close that was. Roxy explains that they weren't able to save the squadron, since they arrived to find that they were all burned to unaliveness. Roxy points out that Corpse seems to know quite a bit about the Chimera, so he explains that he was told by a Galian survivor. Roxy recalls seeing a Galian girl with a large axe, and wonders if that's who he is talking about. She also heard rumors that this girl sent a lord flying, but our boy just plays dumb. Roxy explains that she also heard that this girl was traveling with a man wearing a skull mask, so our boy has no choice but to confess. Roxy just teases him and explains that he reminds her of someone she knows. She says that this guy should be in the capital right now, but she feels as though he is right there with her. 
Being apart from him has made her think about a lot of things, and she wonders if he is happy. Corp surprises her when he tells her that he is sure this guy is happy, even though he isn't supposed to know anything about him. Corpse plays it cool though and says that this guy is a lucky man to have her care that much about him. Corpse is glad to see that Roxy hasn't changed at all, but he instantly feels a sharp pain. He can't understand why his gluttony skill is acting up at a time like this, and Roxy wonders what is wrong with his eye. Corpse doesn't want her to see his monstrous side, so he takes off running. Things couldn't get any worse as fate can smell that a certain scent is close. It's the Chimera and it comes bursting through the cave wall. Fate brings out his scythe, but imagines Roxy in the place of the Chimera's core. He still attacks the core violently and demands that Roxy stop looking at him that way. The fight is over and Fate notices a mark on the Chimera. It's the same mark that was on the Salamanders, so Greed is certain that someone is targeting Roxy's life. Fate recalls how Eris wants to take Roxy's life and is determined not to let her go through with her plan. Roxy arrives late to the party and the cave collapses a bit. Duckstone just so happens to perfectly be right there, and Roxy explains that this crystal is formed from monsters. Roxy reunites with her group, and they're glad to see that everyone is safe, except for the entire squadron that was brutally burned to death. Elsewhere, we get a quick look at some cool looking blonde version of Corpse with a glowing green eye. Sometime later, Roxy surprisingly tells Corpse to draw his sword, and challenges him to a fair duel. Of course, Fate has no clue why she would say this, but Miria tells him to stop acting so innocent. She reveals that he has a huge criminal record. 56 incidents of violence with other warriors and 20 cases of destroying property. Corpse explains that those were all cases where someone came at him, but they don't want to hear any excuses. Roxy refuses to allow any violent acts to go unpunished, so Corpse wonders what he can do. Roxy reveals that he only has one other option, and that is to join the Royal Army. Once he does, then even the rowdiest of warriors won't want to mess with him. Corpse explains that he doesn't like being a follower, and Greed agrees that fate needs his freedom to be happy. Roxy explains that if he is choosing to refuse, then he will need to reflect on his actions in a jail cell. Fate refuses that as well, and draws his sword instead. Roxy points out that his scabbard will break if he fights with it on, but Corpse isn't worried since it's specially made. The two begin fighting, and it becomes very clear that Roxy will not be holding back. Fate determines that he should have the edge in terms of stats, but he isn't able to overpower her for some reason. Greed explains that it's to be expected of a holy knight like her. Her technical skill came from daily training. Fate is then startled when it becomes obvious that she is targeting his mask. Roxy explains that if he isn't going to take their fight seriously, then she will simply expose his identity. She nearly chops off his head with an attack, and she tells him that if he doesn't want to get exposed, then he needs to get serious. Fate does just that and shocks everyone when he prepares to use the Holy Sword technique skill. He isn't supposed to be able to use it without a Holy Sword, so Fate reminds them that his scabbard is specially made. It's actually a weapon add-on that improves Holy Sword techniques made from the magic crystal he gathered at the Great Ravine. Roxy wonders if he was a former Holy Knight, but he isn't the same person anymore and states that he is just a warrior now. He begins his powerful attack, and it becomes clear to everyone, including himself, that he is about to win. However, just then, Fate sees that Roxy created a necklace from the gemstone he gave her. This simp gets way too distracted, so Roxy uses the opportunity to knock his sword away. Greed spins rapidly and calls Fate an idiot for not focusing. Corpse admits that he lost, but Roxy wants to know why he suddenly eased up. He acts like he has no clue what she is talking about, and she wonders if Corpse learned his fighting style from Sir Aaron. The way he strikes and his footwork remind her of Aaron's. Roxy remembers that Aaron spoke of a traveler that had power so great as to cause him difficulty. She wonders if that was Corpse, but Corpse tells her that none of that matters. All she needs to focus on is being able to protect herself and Galia. Fate begins to leave and thinks about how kind she is, since even though she is in danger, she is thinking about him. Mugen then talks to him about the chimera that were being controlled. It was strange to see one being controlled by another monster, and Mugen explains that his family has studied Lost Galleon technology for generations. Corpse recommends that Mugen have his daughter examine a chimera, but Mugen assumes that Corpse is just trying to meet her. Mugen thinks he has bad intentions, and promises never to let a guy like Corpse date her. Elsewhere, we see his daughter named Rain. She is told that the Valerics are going through some serious stuff after Hato died. Rumors say that Raphael has locked himself in his room to study the Philosopher's Stone relentlessly. 
Rain looks it up and finds that the Philosopher's Stone is able to heal any wound. It can also grant its owner great power. However, in exchange, it dominates the mind and body of the owner. At home, Fate has a memory of something Mind told him. She explained that Fate should aim for something called the Domain of E. It's the level of power that the Divine Dragon is at, and if he can't make it there, he won't be able to fight it. The only problem is that if he pushes too hard, his skill will overwhelm him and Fate will lose control. Just then, an alarm sounds and Northern informs Roxy that a massive stampede, also known as a Death March, is underway. Roxy plans to intercept it and tells her troops to prepare to march to Galia. Fate goes to see the Death March for the first time and sees that Roxy has arrived with the Royal Army. Greed, always the smart mouth, wonders if Fate intends on playing the hero once again. Fate is certain that Roxy can handle the situation but wants to be ready just in case. He enters a half-starvation state and Greed points out that he is able to control it much easier than before. Just then, Greed reveals that something is approaching the royal army from the east. This thing is moving through the ground the way a whale swims. It is huge and if it continues on its path, it will end up right beneath the royal army. They are distracted by the death march and are very susceptible to a surprise attack. Fate has Greed turn into a bow and uses his gluttony skill to amplify the charge to give it twice as much range. It's a modified attack, only usable in half-starvation status. Greed compliments him on the attack and the creature reveals itself. This thing is a huge slime monster and it has the same emblem as the other controlled monsters. Fate decides to find out what's behind it all and prepares to attack. His analysis reveals that this crowned beast has stamina, magic, and spirit stats all over 10 million. Greed points out that even a holy knight would lose to this thing and quickly changes into a shield to protect fate from acid rain. Greed warns that fate will die if it touches him, but that means he won't be able to fight up close at this rate. Even if he manages to cut it, that will only cause acid to spray everywhere, melting fate along with it. Fate decides to give Greed 10% of his stats and use an arrow with fire on it in the hopes that it will evaporate the monster. Unfortunately, the slime creature managed to split itself in half and partially avoided the attack. It dives into the ground again and heads directly for the royal army. Fate chases after it but must destroy some of its babies that popped out of nowhere first. This was a pretty advanced technique and not likely one that some dumb slime monster would use on its own. Fate then finds a spot where the creature will have to come out of and prepares to destroy the core. He gives Greed 20% of his stats this time to create a more powerful attack. Greed is stunned since Fate wants to use a move they never even practiced before, but Fate fires the arrow anyway. Just before the monster is hit, something else seems to hit the slime first. Fate has no clue what that was, but is glad to hear his gluttony skill activate. Shockingly, the slime is still alive, which Fate can't understand since he took its soul. Just then, Fate sees that someone is watching him and they are wearing a perception altering mask just like he is. Fate assumes it's Eris and attacks hoping to expose her. Greed realizes that this person has a weapon of mortal sin and it's the Black Gun Sword, Envy. Greed explains that the slime was hit with something before and it was some kind of magic bullet that draws out latent power. That is why the slime is still alive without a core. The core itself became capable of splitting up, which it did to survive. This thing is even more of a threat now as it's capable of infinite replication. The slime consumes fate and Greed fears that he is done for. Luckily, Fate emerges soon after and Greed realizes that he must have already figured out the slime's corrosion magic. The slime won't be a match for him any longer and he goes to confront the mystery person. His gluttony skill activates but Greed warns him not to overdo it. If his stats spike too suddenly, it can drive his skill into overdrive. Before that happens though, Fate is determined to take Eris down. He launches an arrow but it's quickly deflected. Greed reveals that Fate has achieved stats as far as a human can go. Now he needs to reach inhuman heights, the domain of E, to go any further. This can only mean that Fate's attack failed because the person he is fighting has already reached the domain of E. Fate attacks with rage, but the mysterious person tells him that he is just wasting his time. Fate realizes that it's not Eris, and this person is clearly a guy. This guy fires from his weapon, so Fate quickly pulls up his shield. Unfortunately, Fate still takes damage and he realizes that this guy is so much stronger than him. The guy approaches Fate to finish him off, but Fate refuses to give up. He reminds himself that he's willing to die and kill no matter what the price. 
The guy is just about to fire at point blank range, but Fate demands that his gluttony skill give him the power he needs. Both of Fate's eyes turn red, and the mystery man is shocked to see that Fate has achieved the domain of E. Fate is super confident now, and thanks the guy since if he didn't run into him, then he wouldn't have achieved this new level of power. Fate goes on the offensive and completely ignores the slime now. The guy tries to shoot some more, but Fate can easily see the attacks coming now. He avoids them all and creates a smoke screen. Fate finally manages to destroy the guy's mask and shockingly finds that it's Northern. He strangely states that Fate is half right in calling him Northern, but refuses to explain why. Instead, he starts playing a flute. Fate wonders what the heck this guy is doing, but Northern explains that he will see soon. Just then, Fate is stunned to see the Divine Dragon approaching. It's headed directly for Roxy, and Northern points out that it will get to her in the next 30 seconds. This psycho states that he and the Divine Dragon will give everything they have to kill Roxy, so he wants to see Fate give everything he has to stop them. He fires several shots at Fate while the slime corner him. Greed points out that Northern is just trying to buy time, so Fate just rushes past everything. The Divine Dragon terrifies everyone when it finds Roxy, but she stands before it and asks her father to lend her his strength. She instantly regrets her decision not to run as the dragon releases its powerful attack and everyone is concerned for her. Luckily for Roxy, however, Fate has arrived to rescue her for the millionth time. The powerful dragon uses another insanely powerful attack, so Fate does his best to stop it again. He refuses to let it harm Roxy, but his mask is completely destroyed. Without even turning around, Roxy begins to wonder if he is Fate. Fate can't keep it a secret any longer. He turns to Roxy and greets her as Fate for the first time in a very long while. Roxy is happy to see Fate once again, but she is startled by his glowing red eyes. The two don't have much time before the dragon attacks again, so Fate tells Roxy to run. Roxy is too shocked to move, so Fate apologizes for lying to her this whole time. He thanks her for everything before running off, and she can only cry out to him as he makes his way to the dragon. Northern mocks Fate for thinking the fight would be easy, but Fate just tells Greed to be ready. Greed explains that their plan should be ready now, so Fate uses an ability called Grand Cross Returnable. This ability ensnares the dragon, but Northern starts shooting at Fate. As they clash, Northern compliments Fate on immobilizing the Divine Dragon with an art he has never seen before. Fate explains that he wanted to fight one-on-one -on -one with him, but he is quickly pushed back. Fate isn't able to keep up with Northern anymore and realize that his stats must have dropped from using that secret art. Northern is certain that he will win and gives three reasons why. The first is that Fate is exhausted from forcing his way into the domain of E. Second, Fate is also devoting a portion of his strength to holding the dragon back. And the final reason is that Northern hasn't even gotten serious yet. Their fight continues so Greed tells Fate to stick close to Northern and not let him get any distance. Northern can tell that Fate is getting desperate by the way he is attacking and realizes something. If Fate gets too far away from the dragon, then he won't be able to maintain the trap. Fate reminds him that the fight isn't over, but Northern can tell that he is just panicking. He is correct as Fate's next attack leaves him vulnerable. Northern takes advantage and shockingly cuts off Fate's arm. Northern is certain that the fight is over now and reveals that Eris had such high hopes for Fate. Fate has caused Northern way too much problems though, so he plans to make Fate pay for it with his life. Just then, Northern gets pierced right through the chest and is stunned to see that Fate was using illusion magic. Fate knew that Northern would let his guard down once he was confident he won. That's why Fate decided to take an all or nothing gamble and sacrifice his own arm. Fate tells this traitor that he can have his arm and take it with him to the afterlife. Fate ends Northern's life and his gluttony skill activates after consuming his soul. Fate then instantly finds himself in a strange place he remembers being before. The girl that was in Haniel's core appears and introduces herself as Luna. She thanks Fate for ending her miserable life but apologizes as she cannot do any more. Fate has no clue what she is talking about but the ground begins to crumble revealing all his victims and he realizes something. This girl was the reason his gluttony skill quieted down. Luna says that that was true, but it's not anymore. She cannot support him. Luna explains that if fate devours the divine dragon, then he will lose control of himself. The ground crumbles even more, causing fate to fall, but luckily he is saved by someone. A familiar voice says that he wondered why fate was being so quiet, 
and Fate realizes that it's Greed. Greed tells him that they need to go back, but Fate needs to tell Luna something. He thanks her for the warning, but explains that he can't let the dragon roam free without its master, and he is going to slay it. As soon as they return, the divine dragon breaks free. Fate isn't sure how much time he has left, so he needs to end the fight fast. Greed is still a smart mouth, as he points out that it would be pretty hard to use a bow with only one arm. Fate wonders if Greed ever wanted to fly before, and he launches him right at the dragon. Fate combines that with the powerful punch, and it does massive damage. He uses his identify skill to see that the dragon has some crazy high level stats, but Fate still has a slight edge in strength. Fate uses his advantage to slice and dice the dragon until it collapses. The dragon still manages to let out a powerful attack, but Fate combines two skills to power up his final blow. This attack is incredibly powerful and cuts right through the dragon like butter. Fate's gluttony skill activates after consuming the dragon's soul, but it causes him great pain. Gluttony tries to take over, but he fights it, knowing that if he loses control, he will become a bigger threat than the divine dragon. Fate realizes what he must do, but so does Greed, and Greed tries to stop him. Fate then accesses Greed's new level, which resets his stats. This way, when he goes berserk, the damage will be minimized. Greed can't believe that in the end, the gluttony skill is devouring Fate as well, and Fate collapses. Just then, Mine appears out of nowhere, so Fate tells her to kill him. Mine reminds him that she warned him this would happen if he pushed himself too much, but he can only apologize now. Mine plans to keep the promise she made and prepares to end his life. However, just then, Roxy appears to save him. Fate wants to know why she would do such a thing, but she gets furious at the question. Fate doesn't even want her to look at him, as her seeing him this way was always his nightmare. Roxy explains that this isn't nearly enough to make her hate him, and she begs him not to end his life. No matter what power he wields, he will always be Fate to her. Fate can't understand what's happening, since the gluttony skill was rampaging before, but it's completely quiet now. Roxy wants them to go back to Babylon, and Fate is amazed that she still accepts him, even after learning the truth. Fate always wanted to save Roxy, but he realizes now that he also wanted her to save him like she did before. Mine leaves as Fate is in good hands, and he collapses into Roxy's arms. Sometime later, Fate wakes up in his room at the inn, and finds that his arm is still missing. Eris surprisingly barges in to inform Fate that he has been asleep for one week. She returns Greed to him, but Greed is upset since he assumes that Fate didn't even realize he was missing. Eris explains that they had to go into the central part of Galia to find him, and so that is why he is dirty. Mine forgot to collect him, so they assume that a monster carried Greed that far away. Mine explains that she was just too busy dealing with Envy. Things would get pretty bad if Envy found another vessel like Northern and started causing trouble again. The girls reveal that Northern was just being controlled like a puppet by the Black Gun Sword Envy. Weapons of mortal sin cannot be destroyed, so Mine used her immense strength to throw Envy to the far side of Galia. Eris then explains that since Fate defeated the Divine Dragon, he has proven his potential. Because of this, they would like his help. Their original plan to create a crowned human with Roxy's death is over now. Fate demands that she promise never to go after Roxy again, only agreeing to listen to her request afterwards. Eris agrees and explains that the original plan was Envy's anyway. With the Divine Dragon gone, the country will be entering a new era, and they need fate for what happens next. It is something that all skill of Deadly Sin wielders have to deal with, so he doesn't really have a choice. Fate agrees to help without her really explaining anything, but he just wants to find out why he was chosen to receive the gluttony skill. Eris wants to fix his arm first, and Fate is shocked to hear that there's a type of magic that exists that can do it. Eris then shockingly reveals that they have to leave before Roxy comes back, as it's too dangerous for him to be around her right now. Just hearing her name was enough to get Gluttony all riled up, so he agrees. Moments later, Roxy makes her way to go see Fate, but is shocked when he isn't in his room anymore. She finds a letter that he left for her, where he apologizes once again for lying to her. He states that he has to leave for now, but he promises to return to her one day. We then get a look back to when Fate was a kid and he was found by Roxy. She was really nice to him, but Fate was a little coward and begged her not to hit him. Little Fate explained that he was scared because she seemed angry at him, so Roxy realized that people really do fear holy knights. She was ashamed about being a holy knight because of this. 
Fate's stomach grumbled as always, so she fed him some sandwiches. Roxy became concerned when Fate revealed that he had no family, but he said it was okay because she made him realize that the capital isn't just filled with bad people. That was the moment she became able to hold her head up and be part of being a holy knight. She hopes to meet Fate again one day and promises to get stronger for when that day comes. Elsewhere, the Valerics discuss how shocking it is that Corpse turned out to be Fate all along. Raphael goes to be alone and is surprisingly thankful that Fate killed his brother Hato. He laughs like an absolute psychopath and the Philosopher's Stone begins to glow. Out in the desert, Fate gives Greed a whopping 40% of his stats. This reveals Greed's secret art of his fourth level called Twilight Healing. This amazingly regenerates Fate's arm, so the girls head back to the capital. Sometime later, Fate is upset, since Greed is as greedy as always and wants a new scabbard, even though Fate just bought him one. He explains that Fate has reached the domain of V, so he needs a scabbard suitable for such a stature. Greed says that if they don't have the money for it, then they will just have to earn it like they always do. Fate finally agrees with his partner and prepares to fight like the glutton he is. Thanks for watching this full season 1 recap. Sign up for my free newsletter if you want to show some support to the channel, link is in the description.